Where to? Who's your favorite superhero? Just go with like Superman. All you've got to do is video your kids asking the question. Just get them to introduce themselves first, and then WhatsApp it to 0879-180-180. That's 0879-180-180. And don't forget to turn your phone on its side and shoot those videos in landscape mode, please. What's your favorite stadium that you played in? It's the OTB Kids Takeover. All week across the Off The Ball channels. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. It is half past seven on this Monday morning. You are very welcome along to OTBAM. It is Owen and Ger with you right the way through until 10 o'clock this morning and a busy show lined up for you. Ger will be with us at 8 a.m. to run through this morning's sports pages. Monday Morning Rugby with Alan Quinlan is back on uh, TuneIn Radio or the Go Loud app or wherever you're joining us this morning. You can also get us uh, on YouTube. He'll be back with us to talk about the big election in world rugby happening Today, Augustine Pichot going up against Bill Beaumont and what that might mean for the sport as a whole. We've got How's the Head coming up later as well. And Miguel Delaney, football writer with the London Independent, will be joining us to talk about the Saudi takeover at Newcastle United. But the big event of the morning, without question, we're going to have two Galway legends on the line talking about four Galway legends and who they might etch into Galway's Mount Rushmore. It's part of OTBAM's Mount Rushmore series. We'd love to hear your thoughts on who should be the four heads that make the Galway Mount Rushmore. You can tweet us at Off The Ball or leave the comments below. The debate is going to rage on, I suspect, after 8 a.m. this morning. To take you there, here is Kleena Foley and Kieran Cunningham on yesterday's Sunday paper review. Uh, page two of the Sunday Independent, Neil Francis, and when he's in the mood, he can be very funny and, and brilliant. And he's talking about Simon Gagan here and just tells three or four different stories of Simon Gagan, his former teammate, which are brilliant. Uh, not least, I mean, he, he opens up with a memory of rooming with Simon Gagan once upon a time. They were given the choice, the Irish team, to mix up the rooming arrangements. And uh, Gagan looked at me and said, come on, large spend a few days with the geezer. I jumped at it. It was comedy gold for three days and the priceless commodity of uninterrupted sleep as well for three nights because uh, the claw had a reputation for being the loudest snorer. And he tells one story, for instance, where at uh, 10 o'clock they were hungry in the room so they got a club sandwich and chips. The chips were covered in salt. The rasher in the sandwich, the saltiest bacon I've ever consumed. Late into the night I woke up with a dry throat and a furry tongue, all that salt. I was parched. I got out of bed quietly, tiptoed to the bathroom, didn't turn on the light, but I poured myself a glass of water. I glugged it down and I remember, remember thinking that even the water in the Berkeley Court Hotel was salty. I poured another glass and drank it before slipping back into blissful slumber. The first kick didn't hurt, but the second certainly did. Oi, large, where the F are my contact lenses? I looked at the empty glass and came to the conclusion that I had somehow managed to drink them in the middle of the night. They were these special soft contact lenses which he had left in saline solution in the glass. They cost 220 pounds, and they were the only remaining contact lenses he had with him. Simon was minus 5.65 short-sighted, which meant he was practically blind without lenses or glasses. And not long before kickoff, replacement pair were found. They weren't the right prescription, but they would have to do. Simon scored a try and generally ran amok, even though he was half blind. The following morning, he was on his way back to London. Cheers, Gio. See you, Franz. I'm sorry about the lenses. That's all right, Chief. Frano says, do you want them back? And uh, that's how the piece starts, Kleena. And there's a couple of more brilliant stories in there about Simon Gagan, who really is not somebody we hear enough from by the sound of things. Oh, it's a fabulous piece, really good. And like former players, particularly from the non-professional era, you know, they have such great stories to tell. Um, and and uh, when he tells them well, Neil Francis does a brilliant job. And so I don't think, I don't want to ruin the rest of the sure. piece for people except to, re to recommend that they read it. I saw... Um, Gagan was so good. People who haven't seen him, um, he was just a god to me. Um, I once went on holidays to uh, to England and driving, uh, just took the car over myself, my partner, we went to Bath 
Um, it may or not have been a coincidence that it was uh, Simon Gagan's first game for Bath. And um, when we got there, we uh, we went looking for tickets the night before and the game was sold out. It was one of the earliest games, I think, that Sky Sport did because I remember uh, our, our, that was being televised live. And I remember because the start of the game was, was delayed because of live TV. But we couldn't get tickets the night before and somebody then said to us, do you know what, they give away the OAP tickets. Um, they sell them off in the morning if you go down to the ground early. So we did and we got in on, uh, we bought two OAP tickets. I was younger then, I didn't qualify as an OAP. Um, and we went to the game and I remember he didn't get much of the ball, but it was worth it just to be there. And everybody in this, everybody in the ground wanted to see Simon Gagan. and it was his first game for Bath. He was sensational. He had, his feet were magic. He just had incredible balance, incredible hands. He was an absolute superstar, but he didn't do a lot of media and not a lot of known about him. And it's just the strength of his character comes across in the brilliant stories that are told here. I didn't realise how tough he was. He's made of steel, isn't he, Kieran? And there's even, without get, going into the same detail as I did with the previous story, you know, Neil Francis recounts when they lost 15-3 to Scotland and in the dressing room, and Noel Murphy walks in and says, don't worry, boys, loads of positives out there. And Neil Francis writes a voice from Clapham, shouts, name them, name one. <laughs> And he gets off his seat, throws the jersey on the floor and walks out the dressing room and the following week slams the team in the Sunday Independent, goes to town on the team and there's absolute uproar. And Neil Francis, it turns out, defends him to the team when they wanted to kick him out of the squad and ultimately they win some games towards the end of that championship. But as Kleena says, there is a granite as uh, steel to this yeah. man that, you know, you, you mightn't associate with flamboyant kind of a winger. But yeah. uh, it certainly comes across in this piece, and he had the misfortune to play at a time when he wasn't getting much of the ball. Yeah, because um, I like Lena, I would have really looked up to him. I think of all the Irish rugby players, he's probably my favourite because maybe in more recent years it's easier to be attracted to a Brian O'Driscoll or Paul O'Connell or Jonathan Sex and see them as something else. But but they've always had quality teammates around them. Simon Gagan for a large part of his career didn't. Like it used to be often said that, you know, he'd, he'd nearly die of frostbite or exposure out in the wing, waiting for a pass from game after game. But I remember when I moved to London and um, watching the Ireland England game in nineteen ninety four in a pub in London. It was just full of Irish a lot of Irish people there and a fair few English people. And that was when he got a famous try in the left hand corner after a brilliant move. The move was actually called Sullivan. Eddie O'Sullivan came up with the move, uh, I think, when he was at London Irish. But also that day, he made a catch. I think it's referred to by Neil Vance in the piece as well. He made a catch, is, yeah. deep in defence, and pivoted and galloped up the wing. Like He had so much to his game. But he references... One of the things that's interesting about this piece, Joe, is he references a few interviews I remember reading. I remember reading the David Walsh interview that he talks about their encounter with drunken Millwall fans after a League Cup quarter final on a train. But he makes it come across as very fresh, you know, retelling the story in his, in his own words. But um, he, he was eating some kind of cake. What kind of cake was it again? Uh, Fruit but he, cake. He was, eating a, he was eating a cake on the train. And this uh, bullet-headed Millwall fan basically demanded the cake of him, reached out to grab it. And Simon Gagan told him, if you do that, you know, I'm going to take the neck of your head of your shoulders. And he had dozens of people behind him. And uh, David Walsh later asked him, um, like, why, you know, are you not worried? Why not just let him have the cake? And he said, if I let him have it, he would have come back looking for more trouble. Anyway, it was my effing cake. <laughs> and that kind of stuff. him up. But there's two little ins and things here. He mentions a brilliant catch he made, uh, from a Rob Andrew Gary Owen, which I think was the 94 game that I referenced. Yes. And he also references uh, catching a baby when his wife was given birth. And the baby, he, he, birth, he helped uh, his wife give birth and the baby slipped out of his breath, slipped, was going to slip onto the floor and mm. he caught the baby. Yeah. It's, it's a remarkable story. He also, there's a little line at the end, I didn't know this, that is. Uh, Neil Francis mentions his his his, uh, his girls are flyers in athletics Ireland. Yeah. Look at. I think we yeah. might get to that. Be a follow. -up. Yeah, well, they've got to have speed in their genes, that's for sure. Yeah. So did Gagan just do very little media aside from maybe that Sunday Independent interview where he slams his teammates or the David Walsh interview? Was he generally not heard of much in his day? 
Yeah, I don't remember him doing an awful lot. I remember that David Walsh piece as well, but he didn't do an awful lot, is my memory. But, it was, but now it was very different as well than Cleaner. Like now yeah, they're all in a row. They're all yeah. in a row today, so they all do interviews regularly. Back then, yeah, it was you know it was the amateur era. He was a solicitor living in England, uh, work uh, playing rugby part time. So outside of the odd feature interview, there weren't many. You know, players weren't interviewed anywhere. Not anywhere like as much as they're interviewed now. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but but much more like the it was be, it would have been much more like the old GA situation. But we would have had way more access to GA players there, and you wouldn't really have had access to people who were living abroad. Really, very little then, you know. And as you say, he was he was trained to be a solicitor. He was based in England, so the only times he probably did interviews was if somebody got him over there, came home. But it was nothing like now. And he he wasn't a guy that you actually saw many interviews with. But this really, it really, what really comes across in this is was his it was his incredible strength of character, and because he was such a uh player, you know, you almost associate that delicateness that he had uh, on his feet yeah. um, and you kind of associate that his personality would have been like that and clearly it wasn't. Yeah, plays like flamboyant winger, behaves like gruff second row seems to be the general. <laughs> yeah. the thing, across the media the last uh, month or so, there's been a huge amount of nostalgia because people yeah. are you know, we're desperate for content. Oh, I know, Kieran. Uh, I know. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> but I've become, I've become fairly weary of it. I know we all had to do it because we all have space to fill. But this, you know, this is a different kind of nostalgia yeah. piece. Like it's not hooked around a date or something. It just this is a guy I know. I played with. This is what he was like, and it's brilliant. Like yeah. it's, uh, it's quite long. It's a full page, and there's a lot of reading in it. And it just, I think it shows. Like sometimes. I could take or leave Neil Francis, but when he's good, he can be very, very good. Yeah, this no, is and it's the, it's the value of that. It's the value of that personal anecdote, isn't it? That he yeah. has something yeah. to tell us that somebody else doesn't have because he shared a room with him and he knew him really well. He knows his family, he knows his wife, he knows his kids. That's the great value of it. And, and you're right. I, I'm wondering, are we all... I mean, I feel so... so. I, I mean, I'm just amazed, really, at the quality of uh, of newspapers and of yourselves and radio at the moment and off the ball and, and elsewhere that you're managing to still produce so much on sport when we've no live sport. And there's some fantastic nostalgic stuff. But but then there is also you're becoming a bit weary of it now as well because there's so much of it, um, and this one definitely has something fresh. Yeah, no, it's it's really really good. It really is. So that's Neil Francis on uh, Simon Gagan. Don't worry, Cleena. We just have about eight months more of nostalgia pieces, and then we'll start getting <laughs> moving again. Soon we'll be doing nostalgia pieces about. Remember that time in COVID when what we did was all your those favorite nostalgia nostal pieces. Top ten nostalgia pieces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely, we need a listicle on nostalgia. Definitely. So uh, they're the two rugby pieces: the James Cronin uh, piece we picked out, and Simon Gagan as well. Uh, Jonathan Northcroft on scouting in the Sunday Times. I'm not sure which of you stuck that one in, but it was an interesting. Yeah. If, if not, I if it not, was fascinating. did you? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have to say it was it was about what I expected to be happening in the scouting world at the moment. I, it, yeah. what, what jumped out at you? Well, it's just um, well, say when I say it was fascinating. A lot of it isn't that new to me, but I, I think there's a lot of people that don't really understand how scouting works now, and I think it's good to see it expressed because. Jonathan actually wrote a, a very good piece. You, I think you remembered before, um, Joe, you talked about in the show about how Liverpool scouted Van Dijk. Yeah. And how I think they, they watched him 40 times um, in the flesh, along with all the video analysis, etc. They talked to people who knew him. They, you know, the same with Klopp. Like, they actually stalked Klopp. Like, they, they were in the hotel lobby watching him, how he interacted with other people. You know, that this is the level of detail that they go in, that goes into now, but he talks to, um, in this piece, Jonathan talks to a guy, Sil Salvador Carmona, who's involved with an analytics firm called Drip Lab. And what struck me, he, he, um, like he gives us an example. He said, you know, we, if a club comes to him and says, we want a new Harry Kane, and he just makes a few taps into his database, mm. and he comes up with a list of people who have the, the kind of attributes that Kane has, but that would be very affordable, that are under... You know, they're maybe 2021, 20, they're under the radar now. And I remember reading this around Mo Salah, that a lot of clubs now, they, d they don't look at, you know, um, the finished article. Like when they, uh, w with all the analytics around Salah and his stats, they indicated potential. They didn't indicate this is a guy who scores 30 goals every year and is going to be football of the year and be a contender with Ballon d'Or. Mm. It indicated that there's, he's, not quite there, 
but he's doing things that with the right coaching and the right environment and maybe a year older, he will suddenly take off. And that's what a lot of... But one of the interesting things about it, I thought it was a lot more common. Like in this, he says a quarter of the uh, Premier League mm. clubs don't use analytics at all. Mm. And a quarter of them have just one man scout, uh, basically scouting operations. Or, you know, the, the, the main sc- guy in charge is just one person. So mm. it's even though it's written recently, but well, uh, Bill Shankly, we've written a lot about Bill Shankly for a thing. And uh, before he signed Ron Yates, who was his captain in the 1960s, he went to watch him personally 20 times. Like that level of detail was going on 60 years ago. Yeah. And it's amazing now some clubs and the clubs that are left behind aren't doing that. But he does reference here the clubs, Leicester's reference here and Watford, Atletico Madrid, Udinese, uh, Red Bull Salzburg, Red Bull Leipzig, as clubs who are very good at unearthing the superstars of the future or very good players of the future even. Yeah. No, it is. It's, it's very interesting. It's Jonathan Northcroft, page 22. I mean, so uh, they use the example, as you said, of, well, find me someone like Harry Kane. So, like, they don't search for specific players anymore or players who catch the eye. They search for a profile. This is what I want. Yeah. Find me those players who fit that profile. So Jonathan Northcroft says, OK, I want Harry Kane for 50 million. What are you going to do for me? And, uh, you know, he puts in his various attributes and out come the names. Like, Tammy Abraham comes out as maybe top of the pile, age 22, Anthony Martial is on the list as well. Lukaku is on the list as well. I've never really looked at Tammy Abraham, Martial, Lukaku and Harry Kane personally and thought they're all in the same mould. Not especially. I mean, they're not miles apart either, obviously. They're a, a certain height and a certain size and probably play a certain way. And to be fair to this guy, he does absolutely concede that this is not the uh, be-all and end-all. He does concede this is almost yeah. like a starting point. And yeah. thankfully, football as as not and recruitment has not got to a point whereby you just you know put in your bit of data, you get your players, you put in the bid. I still think there is an emphasis on football on going to see the players, judging them with your own eyes, and even maybe spying on them to see what their personality is like. So it sort of it sort of seems like where this fits into football now is that this is. Uh, a, a brilliant way to sift through 130,000 players from 180 competitions and give you your 10 to go and watch. But beyond yeah. beyond giving you your 10, I still think it's up to you and up to your eye and up to your intuition a lot. Yeah, yeah and he almost, he admits point. that, Joe, doesn't he, too? Because he, he does say in it, uh, data should give you the first filter, but then you have to go watch the players and find out all the things data can't tell you. And to me, very often, they're the most important things. Body language, family situation, behaviour, how a player is off the ball. There are certain things that you can't measure. Mm. Um, and it's like if you took it back to Simon Gagan, do you know what I mean? You could do a profile of Simon Gagan, but nowhere in that profile might it tell, might it tell you about that strength of character and, and that individuality that I have. Mm. I, I wonder, yeah. Kieran, will we ever get there? You know, I know in, I think it's MIT, they're trying mm. to, uh, you know, you, you measure various things and predict which team is going to win. They're trying to measure team spirit and it's like the next frontier, it's near impossible. But like if you say yeah. to me, Harry Kane and Anthony Martial, I can tell you right away a big difference in those two is their personality. Yeah, but it's funny because I mentioned Shankly because I've been beaten up about him, so yeah. he's in my mind. And, and one of the things Shankly used to say, he was once asked, uh, what do you look for in a player? And he said, I look at their parents. Mm. So yeah. that's, you know, he, he actually put store in, you know, this guy's background and just how his character has been shaped and, you know, the, the impact that that can have on his football. But the way Jonathan Orca, this piece finishes up, I think is interesting. Mm. And that the guy says... The clubs he pays special attention to are the best clubs in the weaker leagues, like Basel in Switzerland, Shakhtar Donetsk, Celtic, Olympiakos, Sparta Prague. And he just says, why? Because one, their players tend to be very good. Two, they compete in Europe. And three, they're likely to get work permits because they would probably already be internationals. And he gives examples. So that was Salah at Basel, Bonyama at Celtic, Van Dijk was at Celtic as well, but he... Uh, he would have been an EU player anyway, and Mane at Salzburg. Mm. But that's that's something I've never considered. But you know, that's I think a lot of people would never have thought about, about that. But that's one of the things people would look at. Mm. I didn't know a lot about this um, data analytics and, and with recruitment players. So I found this a really interesting piece, Joe. I think some people would if they don't know much about it. And I thought that point that you that that uh, Kieran has just underlined about you know the clubs, why he he can target in those particular clubs. I thought that was really interesting as well. It's a good piece.
Yeah, it is, absolutely. And the interview finished with uh, this guy having to get off the phone from Jonathan Northcroft because there was a French club calling and he needed to go and do some work for them. So business is clearly good. So let's go from, this, in, in terms of opposites then. So if this is looking at the hard data of players, then Dennis Walsh with Paul Tierney, the former Cork hurler, is uh, about spirit and personal awakenings and personality and just the total opposite of stuff you can measure on paper. So what, what's this about? Uh, Kieran, do you want to take that? Uh, uh, it, it, yes. he, he was a former Cork player, um, a Cork hurler, um, and he would have won a medal with the uh, Cork team of 2004. I Should think. I remember him? I don't really remember him. I don't remember him, certainly, so okay. I don't I don't know whether Kieran does. Okay. Well, no. Cork fans, Mike, Paul Tierney is his name, so he was a hurler. Yeah, and he he um, he he left hurling and he went into adventure racing really. Um, and it's a very good piece about just why he's got so into endurance sport and how he got involved in it. Um, I actually there was a name in this that I recognised because it's referenced that he was living um, at one stage in the Lake District with his partner Sarah McCormick, and she would be really really well known in Irish athletic circles because she was a brilliant mountain runner um, and our top mountain female top mountain runner at one point. Um, but he obviously he made a, he made a film on what he did last summer, and it was um, he scaled 214 peaks in a little over six days in an endurance feat, and he did it in what was the time at the end? The clock stopped at six days, six hours, and five minutes, nearly seven hours faster than the guy who had done it before, and he did it. Um, and he's just he he left hurling. Is he? It's really interesting. He said he said. Um, I never, I was never terribly talented at any sport. I've always been a trier, um, uh, but I was ret determined. And he says that, you know, he, he says something which, which I thought was unusual. He said, um, you know, people often ask that question about what, what would you have done? Uh, you know, do you have any regrets in your life? And he says people who say they don't have any regrets in their life actually are wrong because he said, why would you not have regrets? You've hardly done everything perfectly. I definitely have regrets about hurling. If I had been better at managing the mental side, I might have done a lot better. I'd love to have played in an All-Ireland final, not just sat on my backside and watched other people doing it because he was a sub. Um, it was obviously, I was obviously happy that Cork won, but I felt like a fraud. I was getting a medal for doing nothing. I felt I never deserved it. And so this, it, then when he took up endurance sports and endurance running, you know, that's how he felt he's proved himself. I, I don't agree with that. I, I think lots of people can have no regrets about their lives and it's not a bad thing. Oh, I, was, I was with him. I don't know how you couldn't have regrets. Well, I suppose it's what you, I suppose it's what you value in your life and what you regret. I mean, you know... Yeah, I, I mean, it's an interesting philosophical point, but I, I do think uh, you can be somebody who has no regrets about your life. You may you may be sorry that certain things didn't happen, that mm. you didn't, but regretting is something 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 that eats away. Is regret not something that eats away at you? No, I'm okay with my regrets. I just think, you know, if, if any of us <laughs> were to go through life again, I would do a thousand things differently. You just, how could you, how could you get it right the first time around? You know, I, if I sit there and think about my life, I'll, I'll send you a text later on with my top 20 regrets <laughs> and you can see what I mean. We can have a glass of wine, we can, chat on, we can chat on Zoom, we'll talk about it. It's, uh, if you could start all over, would you still be sitting in that seat? Uh, well, possibly not, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, but I, I just, I, I do, when, when someone says, I've no regrets, and maybe to be fair they mean, well, if I hadn't made certain mistakes, I wouldn't be the person I am today, and they've all shaped me, and I like who I am, yeah. so therefore, yeah. therefore I'm glad, you know, the mistakes were, were necessary. I, I, I understand that, but when he says, if you don't have regrets, you obviously haven't really examined what you've done in your life. When I read that, I thought, that's a great line, and I, I believe that, I think that's true. I, I just, yeah. uh, I don't know how anyone couldn't regret at least a handful of things they have done or chosen. Kieran Cunningham, how many regrets do you have in your entire life? <laughs> if this show isn't long enough, I know this show is five hours long. It still isn't long we'll do a nostalgia piece I on your top I've ten made, regrets made, from the I've 90s and 80s. I've made lots of mistakes in my life and okay. I've made wrong decisions probably in my life. But I don't regret them because to me, when you use the word regret, it, it, it seems to intimate, in the, in the context he's using in particular, mm. someone that's eaten away at you. You know what I mean? And, and I think that's the, maybe the difference. But maybe that's what separates people who have this incredible, and he clearly has incredible because he makes a point and it's a really good piece about endurance running and mm. uh, and mountain running about how most of it is mental you know and mm. and uh, and maybe i'm just weak mentally <laughs> no 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 far from it the way he finishes up joe is um 
And it's something I've thought about a fair bit. When you look at, you know, people who are journalists on squads and all Ireland final day and you know, what does yeah. it really mean to them? They've put up in so much work and trained so much. And they're obviously happy, you know, they're part of it in a way and they're happy for their teammates and happy for the county. But they must feel very excluded as well. And he says he felt like a fraud, you know, the day Cork won the All Ireland. You know, he got he said, I got a medal for doing nothing. I never felt I deserved it. And I think there's a lot more people that feel that way than you ever hear about. And it's a very strange situation to be in. I think some of them end up being a little bit haunted by it. That they look at that medal and they think, you know, why do I have that medal? What mm. did I really do for it? Mm. Yeah, I've no doubt. By the way, the 214 peaks he mentioned are in the Lake District, if you're wondering. There is a set of peaks called the Wainwrights because there was an Alfred Wainwright more than 50 years ago who illustrated the Lake District in seven volumes of books. Uh, more than two million copies sold. Each peak, except one, rises to more than a thousand feet. And so he did all of these as consecutively 214 peaks and did it in an exceptional uh, time as well and they've made a video of it. I must try and get the film because it sounds like it'd be great. It sounds like he went through hell and back as well. Yeah. There's a yeah. Se scene in the uh, film he references where effectively he's just saying, I can't go on, I'm in pieces, I need to stop and I'm not enjoying this, why the hell am I doing it? He does say of his hurling that I've thought a lot about this side of things, that's the mental strength required for hurling and I suspect when you're climbing 214 peaks you have a lot of thinking time. I've gone back and I've thought about how I was set up when I was hurling mentally. It was one of my biggest weaknesses, my mental strength. If I did something wrong in the first couple of minutes, that used to just eat away at me. My mind would be thinking about not missing the ball. I was worrying about messing up. And Dennis writes, in ultra running over extreme distances, you can manage your body by controlling your thoughts. And so that's something maybe that he's found a certain enjoyment in doing. So he's, I, a, he's I, very reflective. I, I think character. that's the fascinating about about adventure racing and particularly endurance. You know, the ultra ultra stuff is really what is fascinating is the is the mental element of it. And I know, having talked to 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 um, particularly ultra runners and people who do these ultra, you know, twenty four hour and forty eight hour things, is um is you know they actually start hallucinating and that becomes really interesting when you talk to them about that and what they hallucinate about and mm. how you drive the body so hard, you know, that actually it's the mind that takes over and then it's a battle with your mind and he captured that quite well and um, Roy O'Connor did a piece yesterday in the Irish Independent with Damien Brown, another um, a rugby player who has chosen to, you know, go into adventure sport and was equally, it was very interesting piece as well. Um, but it, they are fascinating um, and I think people are always interested in what makes people do these things and then how do they manage when their body is pushed to the very extreme. Yeah, well, it's on page 20 of the Sunday Times. Paul Tierney is that hurler's name from Cork. Won in All-Ireland in 04, and now he's doing extraordinary things when it comes to long-distance uh, racing, I suppose, for want of a better word. Send your regrets into 53106. You'll get us out off the ball on Twitter as well. <laughs> read them out on air. Let's see what we got out there. Let's empty the closet. You never extend your mind, Joe. Never. Oh, yeah. no, listen, I'll send you mine later. I, I, I'd say a minimum about 3,000 regrets. So... Uh, while we finish with oh, we, we, two last pieces if we can squeeze them in we've about six, seven, eight minutes so really not much time and I know you both uh, you, Kieran, you mentioned JJ Hanrahan in the Mail on oh, yeah. Sunday and I know Kleena yeah. mentioned Tommy Conlon's piece on the Bertie Bowl which is a great old read as well so do you want to just give a nod towards them and explain what caught your eye or why yeah. you like them Kieran? JJ Hanrahan yeah I'll just go on uh, JJ Hanrahan it's just um, uh, the next big like, thing you know it happened What's that? The next, the next big the next thing. Thing. But like thing, you know, half for Munster, obviously, um, it's a heavy shirt because of the people who have worn it before. You know, when you wear that shirt, there's certain expectations. And, uh, you know, he, he he makes no secret of it that he found things very difficult. So, uh, oh, but, um, like, it goes back to, what should they get? Uh, the Racing 92 game. Where he missed the drop but goal. He, yeah. When he missed a drop goal and finished 21-21, he yeah. says, he says, uh, for any person who thinks they have a mind that wanders, when you're a game like that, there's no thinking. You're so immersed at the moment, you actually realise how much you miss it when you're out of it for this long and how much you crave that feeling of... Um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm mixed up here. That was a certificate. No, but he's talking about that miss and he says, look, you can look at it two ways. It's a 10, you take it all on yourself. That weight of the team and yourself, and when the opportunity comes, you have to nail it. That's the bottom of the line. At the end of the day, my big belief, you're never too far away from a good game or a big game. You're always in the middle there somewhere, so that's kind of the way you focus on it. 
We got to a certain level, had the opportunity to win it, but we didn't take it. But he, he does say I was, that he was crippled by the weight of monster history. It's used as a headline. And it's something that you see with a lot of big teams, you know, whether it's Liverpool or Manchester United, or it's the Kerry footballers, the Kilkenny hurlers, that the tradition can be a great help, but it can also be a massive burden. Yeah. Because you are supposed to live up to a certain standard. Well, it's funny, There's you no know, when, when, the, when the drop goal attempt happened this season... Uh, just because it was a monster number 10 and because of everything Algara did, you just sort of presume, well, a monster number 10 makes those drop goal kicks. Yeah. And that adds yeah. to the pressure yeah. and that adds to the fallout afterwards as well. You're instantly compared to Ronan Ogara, whether you like it or not. Ogara would have got that kick. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. This is OTB Sports Radio. Thursday Night Football with John Giles. Who was that talking? Roy Deeney. Well, I think he should keep his mouth shut and have more respect for the opposition when he plays against them. And look at himself. If he was such a great player and was able to do all the things that he's talking to other people not doing, he wouldn't be on the bench. He'd be out there playing. The best analysis of all the week's football from Ireland's number one football man. I was after the Munich Air disaster. It, it, was, it was thrust on Bobby. And, and there was not a lot of pressure on Bobby. He was carrying the team and he handled himself with it and he played unbelievable stuff. John Giles, every Thursday at 7.30pm on OTB Sports Radio, live 24-7 on the Go Loud app. OTB AM. Yeah, you're very welcome along this morning. If you've just joined us, it is 8 o'clock on Monday, the 27th of April. And uh, Jaron Owen here with you every morning from 7.30 all the way through until 10. We've extended the show for the duration of lock-in, which, you know, might be quite a while at this point. Owen, uh, hopes are receding for us to see any live sport in the near future. So, you know, an extra half an hour of the morning. That's exactly what people want. Give the people what they want, Owen. What, what is receding your hopes this particular morning, Jer? I don't know, just the, the general mood music. Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm actually completely wrong. There's various stories in the back pages about how at least the planning stage has reached the point where consideration is being given to a certain amount of testing going on for inter-county players. I, I just, I can't, I can't work out how willing or otherwise people would be to submit to this level of testing for, you know, we keep being reminded, an amateur sport. Yeah, I guess that's that's probably a good point. That's if you want to look at the worldwide possibilities of uh, actually having live sport over the next couple of weeks, it, it all kind of seems like uh, some sort of futuristic movie where you've got a very big budget and uh, a, a very flashy cast. Uh, but can that be replicated in, in an amateur organisation that we have in Ireland is a question that I think we've all had. And uh, it's a question that's going to be very difficult to answer and one that actually seems that it's uh, quite far away in terms of the possibilities at the moment. That, uh, like you, you don't want to be a, a downer on everything that people say and I think hope is really important. Uh, but realistically, if you look at what the Bundesliga is going to do soon in, tr in trying to get back on the, the pitch, you can't just take that and transfer it to Irish sport. No, no, you can't. The fact that the um, that there's news coming from Italy, which I'll get to in a minute, which is positive about uh, at least a, a graded return to something, is interesting. Um, and the fact that the Germans are going back, that will at least, uh, you know, build some kind of a template for this is how we did it. Maybe that's not going to be applicable in this instance, but it might be applicable the next time that something like this happens, where everybody realises, oh, okay, this is how the Germans did it the last time, and that worked for them. There was aspects of this plan that worked in this country, and there were aspects of this plan that worked in this country, and you bring all these things together so that we at least are learning that um, the next time there's a global pandemic, just let that linger there for a second, that uh, we'll at least have a, a template in place for getting through it quicker. What's, I haven't seen the Italy story, what's the... Top line there. Well, I'll, I'll read the sports bulletin for you here. Italian clubs will be allowed to return to individual training on the 4th of May and team training on the 18th of May. The Italian Prime Minister says the country is ready to enter the next phase of its response to the coronavirus by lifting the county, country's lockdown restrictions. Serie A has been suspended, obviously, since the 9th of March, with 12 full round of games still to play. The Italian Football Federation said last week that it would push back the formal end of the season from the 30th of June to the 2nd of August to allow time for remaining games to be completed. So, um... Obviously, Italy, we've seen the scenes. That was a horrific experience for the country to still be going through. I don't want to minimise exactly what, what is happening, but the trend is slowly going in the right direction. Um, I know 
with that happening and with there at least being a plan, maybe this plan is completely foolish. Maybe this plan makes no sense. Maybe this plan is far too early. But uh, certainly they're talking about it. And the 4th of May is like essentially next week. Um, and the 18th of May is only two weeks beyond that. So that would be collective team training. And there's no point in doing collective team training unless you think the, the sport is coming back. So in Spain, the Spanish season is unlikely to return until the summer, according to the country's health minister. La Liga president Javier Tebas has given three potential restart dates between the end of May and the end of June. But Spain's health minister added that the league's plans to provide daily COVID-19 tests for players requires government approval. When these stories emerge, you always kind of feel like the La Liga president and the Spanish health minister must have had a conversation. And uh, I guess that's always an assumption too far because they have different outcomes that they want. The Spanish health minister wants public health. The La Liga president needs to get football back. Otherwise, uh, some of those clubs are going to go bust. The Danish FA said they might not be able to host matches at next year's rescheduled Euro 2020 tournament. Um, obviously, this tournament has been pushed back a year. As a result, Copenhagen faces a clash with the start of the Tour de France. I didn't realise that the Tour de France was starting in Copenhagen next year. All host cities, including Dublin, until, have until Thursday to confirm to UEFA that they can host games. So there'll be news coming this week about how many games Dublin might be hosting in 2021, if at all. The GPA is remaining tight-lipped on a failed drugs test by an intercounty footballer. It was reported over the weekend that a player in his 30s allegedly failed the test after a National League game in February. The player in question has 14 days from receipt of notification to respond to the charge with a request to have the B sample um, tested must be given within seven days. It's unclear if the player in question will contest the charge. And in rugby, the IRFU, according to reports this morning, will continue to back Bill Beaumont for a second term with voting already underway for the uh, president of World Rugby. The IRFU are set to keep faith with the man who's led World Rugby since 2016 rather than backing the former Argentine international Agustin Pichot. The results will be announced on the 12th of May. Here's what's coming up on the show this morning for you. Six minutes past eight. Got to get into the sports pages. Um, Alan Quinlan is going to join us at 8.40. We'll talk about the tectonic plates of World Rugby and uh, how much of an impact this is actually going to have on grassroots, etc. If you have any opinions on that, you can get us on uh, 0879 How's the head? Is coming your way at uh, 8.50. Mount Rushmore today is Galway. We have Mark Rossini Kelly and uh, Michael Lester picking the Mount Rushmore of Galway for us. And then Miguel Delaney is going to join us at 9.40 to talk to us about... Uh, the Newcastle takeover and the sports washing that the Saudi Arabian government are getting into. Um, on the Galway one, do you at least accept that this is a, a difficult one for people to pick? Yeah, it is. It's not. It's uh, like uh, a good collection of sports. Uh, like it's it's not something that you would find too easy to actually come up with your top five or six names or or even when it comes to the, the top one or two I think that there is going to be a bit of debate around that like who is the person that will represent hurling if you only had one person to represent the sport and same with football those are both extremely difficult questions and you suspect I'm just trying to think off the top of my head you suspect that those are going to be the leading sports when it comes to this uh, conversation later on so it's a difficult one for sure uh, one of the more difficult ones and they've got a, a proud sporting tradition I think it's fair to say uh, they do you would say that there are other counties who would have been more surprising in terms of their abilities on the world stage, or like, has Galway have Galway underachieved? Like, what what are you trying to get at? Is is there particular teams? Well, is there particular individuals? Well, when you, you're talking about football, right? So they had uh, that amazing team, um, the Sean Purcell team, and then they have the the other team, John O'Mahony's team, and that's. Essentially it, right? Well, they've won an All-Ireland and multiple All-Irelands in the other code as well, which definitely... In football, sorry, but in football, your... yeah, sorry. But in, in, in hurling, like, it definitely feels like they've underachieved. They, they left countless All-Irelands behind them. Um, that team of the 80s was one of the all-time great teams, but doesn't have the All-Irelands to show for it, and partly because they didn't have any games every year. But uh, I don't know, I feel like that perhaps... Look, we can put this county to this question to... Maura Trassa and, and Michael Lister a little bit later on. But have Galway as a sporting county underachieved? I don't... I think if you take everything in isolation and perhaps pre-2017, you could have definitely made that argument about the hurlers. Definitely. Uh, I think... I'm not sure if that team around uh, the turn of the century necessarily underachieved with two All-Irelands. I think that's a pretty good 
uh, turnaround for for any team really to produce two All Irelands. Like I, I, I wonder if sometimes we kind of hold up this Galway team as like one of the best teams of all time, and that they deserve to win five All Irelands. Maybe they did, and but I would say that perhaps two All Irelands is. Like that's a decent return for that Galway team. Maybe they could have deserved three, or if the the age profile had been right for a full decade, they might have been able to squeeze out four. But I don't think it was a massive underachievement. I think when you are, are partaking and trying to win the All Ireland in both codes every single year, there was going to be a dilute a diluting of what you're actually going to win. Cork are one of the rare counties you've been able to do it down through the years, uh, and their output of both has been excellent. But then then again, their output this century really hasn't been amazing either. So like it's. I'm not sure if I'd go with, with underachievement. I think that but every sports fan, a, a, any fan in Ireland can describe themselves as long-suffering. And Galway are, are no different to that. They've had near misses and they've had close shaves. But whether or not they've, uh, they're a county of underachievers, I, I don't think I would go that far. All right. Uh, 0879 is the number. You can uh, get us on Twitter. Use the hashtag OTBAM. Or, of course, you can always just uh, tweet the show. Add off the ball AM is the show's Twitter account. Ten minutes past eight. Time for the papers. OTB AM. So we're going to start this morning with OffTheBall.com. The 32 Mount Rushmore is Galway's greatest sports people. Um, there aren't brilliant soccer players and there aren't uh, rugby players who have bestrode the game like a colossus. There are local cult heroes, I guess is the point I'm making. There are athletes, in fairness, um, male and female, but like, where's their, you know, where's their Premier League player who had 10 seasons in the Premier League? Where's their 50, 60, 70 Ireland caps? in rugby and football. Um, right, uh, the other stories that we have this morning, Lee Dixon explains what it was that made Ryan Giggs so deadly. Uh, an hour-long feature-length interview with Lee Dixon on yesterday's show. Um, likewise, a feature-length interview uh, with Shane Byrne. I threw my first line out for Ireland directly in front of my stag do. Uh, null and void, how can that work? Lee Dixon on finishing the season, he feels like it has to be finished. And uh, Kieran Fitzgerald, the Curfin great, has retired from playing club football. An absolute honour to play for Corfin GA Club and for Galway as well. And uh, so that is um, the homepage of uh, offtheball.com a couple of minutes ago. But we've also just published um, Walking on Water, the story of how the GPA won their war with the GA. This is a, a great piece from Arthur James O'D. It is uh, an oral history of the Club Energise ad, which was called Lake, where a bunch of hurlers and footballers literally walked on water in Lugala, and I say literally as in in the ad, they literally walked on water, as opposed to metaphorically, they literally were walking on the lake on stilts uh, in the freezing cold. And this is the story of how the ad came to be and what it represented. Spoken with loads of the uh, hurlers and footballers involved, Dermot O'Sullivan, Steve McDonnell, Eamon O'Hara. Spoken with the ad agency executives, the director who made it. Um, spoken with the marketing director of CNC at the time, who kind of put the deal together alongside Desi Farrell and um, spoken with Donald O'Neill, of course, who was kind of the, the advisor and the commercial director, the first original commercial director of the uh, GPA back at the time. So um, super in-depth piece, about 3,000 words, I think. Um, that'll take you, that'll, that'll put an hour in for you this morning. And um, I, like I thought it was a fascinating slice of life at a very important hinge moment in the relationship that the players have with the GAA. Yeah, it's it's a phenomenal piece. I mean, like it's uh, one of those that you didn't realise how interested you were in the subject until you start reading it, and uh, it's done in oral history format, which uh, makes it a, a very easy read as well. Uh, like I, I love this uh, uh, the quote very early on from Michael McArdle in the article saying, "We didn't want another GEA player in the Farmers Journal with a box of medicine at the end of a hurley." Uh, and not so veiled dig. That that was John Fenton, right? Who's uh, who, who had the the box of medicine at the end of uh, the hurley. So and a not so veiled dig at him. It was, and, it was all like, of them. Oh, and it wasn't just one. It was all of them. There was like about fifteen of them who all made like three hundred quid for whatever mastitis cure there was at the time. For liver fluke. Uh, liver fluke. <laughs> I, uh, I it must be just uh, Fenton is obviously the most famous one, and it, I think it's also the only one that's available on YouTube. So. Uh, the rest of them, unfortunately, have got lost in time. But uh, Joe maybe Cooney wrestling a steer, like he was literally kind of wrestling a cow and jamming the thing into the whatever the injection was, the the medicine into the cow. It's like, look at look at that strong man on the farm. <laughs> and these guys are like, uh, these guys are walking in water. These fancy dans coming along, walking. Who were they? Uh, Celebrities. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of like a uh, three hundred euro, uh, Don O'Neill says in the piece that they approached Lucas Ed for a deal first. 
and they offered them 500 quid. They offered uh, the GPA and GA 500 quid uh, to actually do an ad for Lucas Aids. They were owned by GSK at the time, and Desi had worked in the pharmaceutical industry. Jay says, wait until you see how these lads respond with all he said when I told him about the approach. Um, it, like it's kind of like illustrates the battle between Lucas Aid and, and Club Energize at this point. And then also there was uh, shots being fired from Finton Jury as well, which I, I didn't realize that he, he was telling the media that they didn't know what they were doing. And he says, this is Donald again, he says he remembers Desi pacing the office and asking how we're going to respond. Um, but he says that he had been to the Harvard of sports marketing and it was only when I came back home I realized that these people didn't know what they were doing. Uh, like the, It does take a fair degree of security in yourself to actually be this radical with the GEA because this could have been something that people would have turned their noses up at pretty quickly. I don't know if you remember, so they, Mike Frank Russell was in it, so maybe you do. I mean, that, I think you would have been at the peak of your Mike Frank Russell idolatry at that point. Um, afterwards, the players would end up being interviewed post-match when they did well and would start drinking from the, the drink mm. on TV. And there were conniptions being had by the uh, TV company, which it was, oh, maybe, maybe TV3 had games, uh, but did they? I don't think they did. Yeah, so essentially, it was um, it was RTE, and uh, they didn't like the notion of like somebody using their real estate to be advertising a product. Like that was, you know, I'm sure there's a guideline somewhere. We need to balance this out. Somebody needs to walk across the screen with the giant Lucas Aid sport in case Lucas Aid might complain to us. Um, and uh, that that comes up in the piece as well. Kind of this fear that perhaps these GA players might be making some money off the sweat of their brow. Who the hell do they think they are? This is not how we've done things for generations. So. Um, yeah, what was my favourite line there? Uh, no, it's misspelling that. Hang on. Basically, you want this ad to look more like Nike and less like Liverfluke. Yes, yes, please. Make us look Nike, not Liverfluke. They succeeded doing that. Like they, they got a director in from abroad to do it, and he didn't know much about GEA. So according to Donald O'Neill in the piece, Desi Farrell, this is his first managerial role, actually, directing... It's ads. I just, sorry, I'm gonna, hang on, hang on, sorry. He's from Belfast, Owen. This is the second time this happened on the show. This is not abroad. The Irish Open was in Ireland. It was in Portrush. Belfast is a part of Ireland. I mean, I, I realise that you're throwing shade at me here as somebody who was born in Belfast, abroad. But that's okay. That's okay. I understand. You know, your, your nationalism like, comes like, through. And, and like, did, I, did I use the word abroad? Or did. I apologise for that. I apologise for that. It's, so, someone, who, someone who admitted he didn't know much about hurling. Why are you born in England? Emma reminds me. Yes, but I must. I misspoke. This was not a. This was not a dig at anybody. All I'm saying is that this director didn't know much about hurling. I'm just a bit touchy about it. On that's all. He um, didn't. He didn't. He says he didn't. He said uh, the irony of my, my being raised a Protestant in Belfast. I had no preconceptions about the GAA and Gaelic sports weren't really something that I was into. I did know about marketing sport though, and to me this was a no-brainer. We needed to turn these lads into heroes and make them look like legends, and so they did. Yeah, and I think there's P. I think, yeah. Um, Eugene Coonan, the, the Galway hurler, I think he does some flick up and Desi's like, yeah, go do that again. So uh, I think Desi was fairly hands on with the whole thing. Yeah. And so there's actually a copy of the ad embedded in the um, it, the, the full piece is a minute long and they different versions of a cut as well. So uh, Muggsy was there and Shefflin was there and a bunch of others, too, that um, uh, and the goals kind of rise up and then they run out onto the water and they play on the lake, and it looks class. It does look class, in fairness, and J.O. was there as well. So when you think back to, um, what year was it? Was it 2000 and, actually, that's a good question. Uh, whatever year it was, was it uh, 04, 05, around that time? Um, what you think back to the, the transformative impact it's had. And sorry, the whole part, point about this is that the money that the GPA make from the deal gives the GPA financial security and they are never going away once this ad happens. So that's why it's a hinge point. It's not just that they've found a way to market GEA players that look sexy and isn't liver fluke and is more Nike, but also it feeds the coffers of the GPA to the point the GA have to take them seriously. And that sets them on the path to being the official players representative body and getting recognition and all that kind of stuff. So um, an interesting sliding doors moment for, uh, for Gaelic games in Ireland. So that piece by Arthur James O'Dea up on offtheball.com this morning. The Irish Independent this morning leads with a photo of Cahar Healy. A long way for Cahar to hear six weeks after his latest knee surgery. Uh, the London-based Liege veteran prepares to run a marathon while scoring 2,000 points. 1,000 with a slitter, 1,000 with a football. The full story inside the Irish Independent this morning. 
Meanwhile, we've got a story here that the championship hopes likely to hinge on extensive testing plan for players. So the HSC have announced, obviously, that they hope to roll out a figure somewhere in and around, in and around 100,000 tests per week by uh, the middle of May. Um, an ambitious plan which could see around 2,000 players, managers and backroom staff subject to regular COVID-19 testing is among the options being explored in order to allow GA and county panels to return to training later this year. And then IRFU set the back Beaumont to stay in lead role despite U-turn speculation. So the IRFU look like they're going to back Bill Beaumont to vote for uh, World Rugby's chief happens today. It's really interesting to me that Bill Beaumont suddenly has become a reform candidate despite the fact that he's been in charge for the last couple of years. I, I love the way you can suddenly all of a sudden change midstream and go, oh, no, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to absolutely radicalise what's coming afterwards. I haven't done it up to this point because, you know, um, I was uh, doing some other stuff. Like, I, I love those elections where it's suddenly like, oh, no, 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 this, the, everything that I've had the opportunity to do that I didn't do, I'm going to do now, seems to be what's going on with uh, the rugby world. Right, the uh, Sports Monday section of the Irish Times uh, interesting story here from Jerry Thornley. Six Nations schedule set for a radical overhaul. Um, Six Nations schedule set for a radical overhaul with organisers considering creating a new window for the women's competition to avoid clashing with the men's, moving it from the traditional February-March slot. There was widespread criticism of the schedule for the tournament this year with a number of the games shoehorned into lunchtime kickoffs, often overlapping each other, and then problems with women's matches being staged on the same day as the men's, meaning fans were unable to attend both. And there was also considerable disbelief at the decision stage, France and England, the title decider on the opening weekend of the 2020 tournament. That match won 1913, attracted a bumper crowd of 14,000. This year was the second in a row that organisers failed to attract a title sponsor for the Women's Championship. Um, a picture of boxing in Nicaragua, which has restarted, is the picture that you can see there with mediocre social distancing from the uh, people in the crowd, but um, sport is back. Uh, Nicaragua has apparently been barely untouched, or barely touched by coronavirus, with its Minister of Health reporting 11 positive cases and three deaths. So, you know, I mean, those stats, they check out. And uh, should size or age dictate in amateur rugby? Just ask Russell Crowe, this is Brian O'Connor's column today. Um, players bought into it 100%. McGuinness, Jim McGuinness, talking about the, um, how hard players were pushed in training. And uh, that's obviously an interesting story, given that the toll that it took on many of those players is only beginning to be, to be felt now. Um, Everton appalled after Keane hosts lockdown party. So uh, the covid Hashtag is busy with the Premier League footballers at the moment, and that is your Irish Times this morning. The Irish Examiner this morning leads with a full-page Anthony Daly column, an insider's guide to magic and mayhem of the Sunday game. So uh, Anthony Daly's column focused on uh, his work on the TV show, a photograph there of Jared Canning from the commentary gantry, and uh, a photograph there as well of uh, Anthony Daly and Don Cusick uh, in studio. You've also got John Caulfield's League of Ireland Dream Team with a difference as well. And uh, that is the Irish Examiner this morning. There's a picture of a uh, big fly in Dalo's head, which I, I missed this. Apparently a giant fly landed on his head at one occasion. And uh, that's what the picture of him and um, Don Logue is there. You can't actually, you, can you see the giant spot on Dalo's head? It looks like uh, he's got a mole, but no, it's not actually a sunspot. It's a, a giant fly that landed in the middle of the broadcast and he had to uh, continue on without it. The, um, sorry, I was supposed to be the Herald, uh, the London Times there, yeah. Football told to come back and lift mood. Government wants sports to return quickly. So Boris is back at work giving the nation a lift, apparently. The uh, BBC politics was the headline yesterday. It's like, all right, uh, Kim Jong-un and, um, and uh, the lads in Moscow wouldn't run a headline like this. But the BBC ran one yesterday about how good it was for the spirits of the UK that Boris Johnson was back around. And maybe it is, maybe that's all it takes for people to be happy while uh, tens of thousands of people are dying around them. The government has urged the Premier League and other sporting com competitions to significantly step up planning for a return to action behind closed doors in the hope of lifting the national mood during the coronavirus crisis. The Times understands that there's been a significant shift by the government in the past few days in favour of restarting sport, with Prime Minister Boris Johnson due to return to work today. After recovering from COVID-19, there is a view that the prospect of live sport returning will create some much needed positivity. Uh, look, maybe there's something in this. It's just that you'd want to make sure that everything is going to be safe when they do it, right? Well, obviously, yeah. I think it would be pretty, uh, it would be very sensible if there was a, a good chance that things wouldn't be safe 
and they were like, yeah, go back to work, go back playing football. And we think that you, you may or may not be safe or whatever. Like, I think that there has to be a, a huge uh, kind of safety net there that things are going to be fine. Like Arsenal are back in training today, as far as I understand this. It's like a situation where a couple of them will go back in because it's actually better off for them going to the training ground. And a couple of them bringing their own balls or whatever, keeping a distance and not having to run around their local area where they're going to get stopped for selfies. Yeah, so they, uh, the Arsenal players are due to return to their London Colony facility today. The club will only allow five players to use their pitches at any one time. Sessions will last for an hour and players will not do any work as a group. Uh, likewise, I think Brighton are also offering their squad access to training facilities under strict guidelines. Players are expected to self-isolate so self at the first suggestion of any issues as well. So Moisey Keane, um, the party's going to cost them 100 grand. Probably not worth it in the end when you think about it. And Premiership at risk of big fall in TV revenue. So the new, the new um, situation with regards to uh, finances is going to be very interesting to see. This is going to have an impact on salary cap in the NBA. It's probably going to have an impact on salary cap in the NFL as well, where very good players are going to end up on the market available because clubs are uh, unable to... Um, deal with the situation. That's a rugby story, I should uh, specify. It's not uh, Premier League. Premiership Rugby is facing a significant drop in the value of its broadcast rights because it failed to agree a deal with either BT Sport or Sky before the coronavirus crisis struck. We're going to be doing a feature on um, a series of uh, uh, feature-length programmes on the future of rugby in the coming days. And um, So I'll do the Herald for you here as well. And the back page of the Herald is just an ad, so I'm going to open that up for you. Uh, and uh, they're going through uh, some highlights from Dublin sports history. Sure is hard to be humble when you're as good as Ali. This is a uh, 10 greatest Dublin sporting moments, in part one today, number 10. And this is Eamon Carr, Ali and Croker in 1972. There's a great picture of uh, Luke Kelly and Muhammad Ali in, there's loads of great pictures. Muhammad Ali and Eddie Kerr. There's Muhammad Ali, Luke Kelly obviously in the ring. And then there's uh, one of Jack Lynch as well, uh, chatting away to Ali. Ali either very intently listening or bored out of his tree. It's hard to tell which. And uh, Albany Lewis was the, the fight um, that he did there. So do you want to do the mail next? Uh, I've got the sun here in front of so, me. Give me five is the headline. FIFA want two more subs to ease strain on stars. Premier League clubs could be allowed to make five substitutions when the season resumes. We've also got Ole Gunnar Solskjaer may flog Pog for buys. He could be forced uh, into a major clear out at Old Trafford to boost his end of season transfer kitty. And John Egan also speaking to the media, eager to get training. He says he hopes to get back training by the middle of next month. Yeah, so that's the, the Irish one there. Um, that's the Irish one for you. That one as well, same thing, give me five. Um, and so, do we do the mail? Do the mail next for you here. That's uh, COVID at Keane hit by 100 grand fine. Um, and GPA refused to comment on failed drug test, uh, which is fairly standard at this stage. The, uh, it's all about Sport Ireland and given whoever it is the 14 days opportunity to respond. It is a matter for Sport Ireland. So, GPA spokesperson Kieran McSweeney, Sport Ireland, already in the record to say they don't make any comment on the potential anti doping process, which may or may not be underway. So, we're going to have to wait for that player to come out and explain what happened and for uh, details on what the positive test itself was. Um, so, I think next for us is going to be the star. And the star is the UK star. Uh, Premier Inn, hotel lockdown plans, get the nod. Top flight football makes return booking. So that's that story that's been rumbling on for ages. Um, that they're going to try and cocoon the players away. It's going to be very difficult for those men in their early 20s who are so rich that they've never had anybody say no to them to be uh, essentially curfewed every day. What was, the, mm -hmm. what was the Michael Irving, who was part of the Dallas Cowboys team? You know, the boys will be boys, Jeff Perlman book. He was, mm -hmm. asked, he was asked about... Um, you know, you're because that that team famously had a, a house called the White House, where um, it was essentially a brothel, and uh, the um, that team, not Michael Irvin, but that team had this kind of uh, reputation for being bad boys. And uh, he was asked, um, you know, under these circumstances, would you be able to play? And he was like, Oh, look, if we had to play, we'd be able to play. We'd be able to stay in if we had to stay in. But you just wouldn't be able to keep the women out. Was uh, was his take on it? So. Um, 
uh, the Dallas Cowboys in the 90s believed that they would have been okay with this, but what's going to happen with uh, young Premier League footballers who don't seem to be able to exert any self-control um, in 2020 when this comes back? That's, I think, going to be one of the main things that derails Premier League football. You know, like unless every single hotel room just has a, a minder sitting outside it. Uh, the Irish Mirror kind of tells us this morning what might happen. Party's over for Moyes. Keen faces 160k fine for flouting social distancing rules in a shindig for mates. Uh, four stars hotel is the headline uh, on that story you've already mentioned there. Clubs locked down in own digs for six weeks with away teams taking other half of accommodation for match. Then a deep clean. Uh, De Gea hints he'll stay with United forever. Big Jim denies that he pushed any goal players to the brink of burnout. And Pards blast back at Hullet in bonus row. So Alan Pardew has rammed Root Hullet's words back down his throat in the 100k survival bonus row. So um, Hullet is obviously question whether Pardew was worthy of bonus payment uh, by default because of uh, Den Haag had avoided relegation. But uh, Alan Pardew was hit back saying, screw you, Root Hullet. Yeah, he's given the money to charity. Um, doesn't like to talk about his charity work, obviously. Training may get go ahead. This is Carlo Kane's story in the back of the Irish Daily Star. Returning to Intercounty GA training this summer is believed to be under consideration by government officials, so that would be interesting. Not a million miles away from um, what uh, they're planning in England as well. Kerry Boss, Peter Keane has said you take anything at this stage. Uh, Destea is the headline there. Sorry, Keeper has no plans to leave Old Trafford anytime soon. And Sean Kavanagh, uh, I still have this 10 inch box of tablets that somebody handed me at an international rules training camp. This is him talking about supplements in the GA, and I guess that's a suggestion that perhaps there's a connection to um, the uh, drug story that there's been, uh, it's, it's, it's supplements perhaps. Having the drug testers in over the years produced a few moments of laughter and plenty of annoyance is the start of his column there. Um, the first hour I was collected for post-match drug test was the 2003 after the Kerry All-Ireland semi-final. Myself, Kevin Hughes, Seamus Scanlon, and perhaps he thinks it was Dara O'Shea. The elation of winning the game was followed by one of these lads taking you into a dark room at the back of the Hogan. You had to sit there for an hour after the game. I genuinely had seven or eight 500 milliliter bottles of Rockwell water before I could pee. Always on brand. It was Rockwell. It obviously wasn't Club Energize. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, yeah, so that, look, that's interesting. I think, uh, again, like we'd love to sit here and speculate about what exactly has happened with that drug test, but it would be uh, irresponsible to do so until we get any of the details. Uh, obviously, we're trying to stack up as much of the details as we possibly can. We'll bring them to you whenever we get them. The back page of The Guardian this morning features a photo of Maradona in 1986. Bernie Rone revisits the infamous quarterfinal and asks the question, were England really robbed by this man? in 1986. Moise Keane faces fine from Everton after throwing party at home is their headline on that and also the rugby is covered here on the back page of the Guardian. Radical rugby overhaul. Women's Six Nations set for separate dates to boost game which is an interesting idea. The Irish News is next. Got the Irish News for you this morning and uh, we'll stick that up now is Madden Tyrone preparing for best case scenario. Red Hands coach hopeful 2020 will see a championship and Tony McEntee picks the best 15 he's played with or managed. That should be a good team. He was on some, he was on some excellent teams. Um, I wouldn't mind pitting some of these uh, best 15s against each other as time goes on. And then finally for now, it's uh, heading over to Spain. Yeah, we've got to ask. Uh, the virus is our priority. Not playing uh, is the headline, which is uh, a fantastic piece of art there. Uh, Nadal, Gasol, uh, a couple of the names mentioned there as uh, Spain looks to get back on its feet. Right, so the um, main stories from that, obviously, um, that we've kind of got into there is that, that, like, look, maybe I was wrong to sound a pessimistic note at the start of the show. Actually, people are, are fairly pessimistic or optimistic that they, uh, they're going to stick the footballers in the hotel. The, um, the government in the UK is definitely pushing for something to return sooner rather than later and ultimately they're going to get their way because uh, it's in everybody's interest, it's in the players' interests, it's in the Premier League's interests, it's in the broadcasters' interests and if you have the government weighing in behind it saying we'll do whatever it takes to get this back to lift the spirits of the nation, um, then we should have Premier League football within the next couple of months. How wise a decision or otherwise that is, I'm not sure but uh, I guess you would hope that there will be enough research done and 
uh, enough safeguards put in place to make it safe. And if that happens, then at what point, at what point would it be realistic from an Irish perspective that the testing regime that they were talking about would be to test into county footballers on a more regular basis than, um, than everybody else? It would kind of make it mandatory. Yeah, like I, the, I, I wouldn't be pessimistic, certainly, about the prospects of getting Premier League football back and professional sport back. I just like the, the complications are just far wider when it comes to amateur sport, isn't it? Like, it, like we've spoken about this before. I think you're of the opinion that if there has to be a, a section of GEA players who can't take to the pitch this summer, then so be it. And for me, those players are frontline workers. Can they just stop their work? To ensure that they can go into some version of quarantine so that they can take to the pitch in a contact sport. And uh, like it's obviously a rhetorical question because no, you can't take frontline workers away from their job at any point for the foreseeable future, it seems. No, absolutely. Like it's, I, I mean, I think we should be having the conversation about whether or not we have some form of games that are played at a relatively high level. Like if it's, a, if it's some kind of bastardized version of a railway cup, like. That's better. I'm like worst case scenario is there's absolutely nothing. Best case scenario is that there's some form of intercounty championship behind closed doors, essentially, or with like social distancing in the crowd, right? That that's the absolute best case scenario you can see in 2020. But everything in between, like old school tournaments, the Oireachtas tournament, like which I don't even really know what the Oireachtas tournament was, right? It, was it an intercounty thing? Do you remember this? They're, like in the in the old. Uh, GA record books where there would have been a list of like so and so won this following number of medals. And you're like, what? Are, what are those tournaments? What language is that? Uh, mm. Like, I would, I would happily take some thirteen aside, under thirties, bastardized version of uh, a parish, like or an amalgamation of counties, like a Dublin North, Dublin South, Dublin West, like just to get games, like that we can sit and watch and go, this is the sport that we are all dying to see. Like, I, so, best case scenario, there's intercounty and it's uh, social distancing and that happens maybe October, November. Worst case scenario, there is nothing, like no games. Everything is shut down, the doors continue to be locked and that's completely the right thing to do from a, a public health perspective. But in between, are we just saying it's either intercounty or it's nothing? No, like I, I, I don't think it can be like that. I, I think that there will have to be the exploration of club action as well, and maybe the the, the club action is more doable without uh, a, a certain sway of people. Sorry, I mean, sorry, I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about representative stuff. Like assuming that uh, whatever happens with the club is is going to happen anyway, because that is the easiest thing to get back up and running. There'll be club training, you would suspect, along the lines of what's happening with. Um, Premier League training at some point, like when, because they're already talking about it. There's a bit what of what about the testing on that? Like, been... what, 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 do we is there going to be an, an enough testing to ensure that all the club players are, are looked after? Well, if there's social distancing, like, and there's no contact for for the first period of time until they decide that actually enough of us now have have had it or don't have it. Like when they're talking about a hundred thousand tests a day uh, or a week. Um, that they're that they've been talking about just recently, like uh, I, there's there's a lot of things that have to fall in place in terms of how we are actually dealing as a society with this. For example, the government has to be formed, and then somebody has to take full responsibility for exactly what the plan is and what our what our outcomes are going to be. So there's a lot of different bits and pieces that have to fit into place. But if you were a sports organisation, if you were global rugby or uh, Irish rugby, or if you were the FAI, and you want games to come back, like what are the scenario planning that you're doing? Is there, I guess what I'm talking about with, when it specifically comes to the GAA, what representative level beyond club can we legitimately hope for? And what are the scenarios that might happen this year? And it's going to have to be like, it might have to be something radical, as you say, because I guess if, if there has to be a large swathe of inter-county players who can't protect with their county, it does cheapen the whole idea of an All-Ireland Championship. And it would have an asterisk beside it, to say at the very least. Like we all, we all, like I think everybody would want to see some sort of action before the end of the year. Like the the, the question is just really, if you are making some sort of uh, amalgamated version of a championship, if you are mashing counties together or having some sort of some form of a like is 
is there just actually a shout for ensuring the clubs just actually have the spotlight altogether? And like even those top class players who are available to play, just go and play with their club. And those are the things that are televised. I'm, I'm just trying to think, what would the public actually care about? Would they care more about watching a Tipperary County hurling game between two top teams? I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the national viewer here. Or would they care more about watching, uh, I don't know, Roscommon and Leitrim taking on uh, a, a Mayo team, for example? I think it might actually be the former because these are actual fully formed teams that we know a victory or defeat will mean as much to them as it would in any other year. Whereas like, I think the, the, your idea is radical and it's like, it'd be good to have something if that, if that's a solution, then great. But if there's also club action going on, then I think I'd probably be way more invested in the club action. All right, it's uh, 8.40 this morning on Monday, the 27th of April. The OTB Kids Takeover is back this week after Brian O'Driscoll and Mayo star Lee Keegan were put to the test in the opening two rounds. We're delighted to say that Simon Zebo is the next star who's going to be joining us for the OTB Kids Takeover, where your kids have the chance to ask him any questions you want. To be with a chance of getting a question to Simon, WhatsApp OTB your question by video, preferably 87 180 We will take some text uh, questions, but we obviously prefer the video 087 180 180 uh, shoot it in landscape if you can that means just turn the phone around and you can send us a message or a voice note as well alan quinlan is going to join us next but first connor moore joined the lads on this week's episode of golf weekly to talk about his brand new show which is taking the golf world by storm have a look if i start going in on him and start talking about how poorly he plays or certain things like that i try to stay away from that like just uh, like it's better to not like yeah, it's better to knock the guys near near, take, take to make out the guys that are doing well. It's like Poulter, like, it doesn't matter what Poulter does. I remember doing at the Open last year, two years ago, I did a, a video of Poulter talking to David Ferrity. And Ferrity was the psychologist. He was like, so why are you in here, you know? And Poulter was like, you know, they're trying to prove to prove the courses out there, you know, stop me from breaking Jack's record. And I was giving it all this kind of stuff in this room. And he's crying away to, but it was supposed to go publish on the Friday of the Open. And then Poulter missed the cut. So this is pre-recorded. So it wasn't like I jumped on it straight away. But to Poulter, I'm thinking, he's going to think he's after missing the cut. Mm. And this little bollocks is after coming doing this now. And I ended up asking the Golf Channel not to put it out. And they said, no, 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 it's fine or whatever. And then my phone, it was out about an hour. It wasn't doing great numbers. Like it wasn't doing great. I was kind of finding my feet at the time. And then this quote tweet, Ian Poulter. And I went into it and he goes, you know, and it was the first time I think he ever tweeted anything out about me. He goes, you know, I've had a shit day today. I look at my phone, I see this, and it's hilarious. Uh-huh. Top man on of sketches. <laughs> uh-huh. Even when I did the gig in the house with him a couple of weeks ago, like as soon as I walked in, he is like just such, he's like the most normalist of them all. All right, mate, love it. And then I was kind of saying to him, I hope you don't like, like obviously I'm, uh, taking a mick and everything else, like it's all whatever. And he was like, "Mate, go as hard as you want. I don't care. You know, <laughs> you got to do. You got to do." And then... <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He's a great fella. He actually is a great fella. Like he's very, very charitable and everything else. And uh, and when I like when I was over at his house, like he couldn't have, him and the family he couldn't have been nicer. Yeah, all that good stuff available wherever you get your podcast. The best place is the Go Loud app. You can get it in the app store or you can get it off the ball.com forward slash podcast. Now, what are we at? 8.42 this morning. Time to say good morning to Alan Quillen. Alan, how are you getting on? What's the crack? Yeah, I'm good, Jaron. Yourself? Oh, good, yeah. Surviving. Um, we wanted to talk to you what you make about what's going on with World Rugby at the moment because um, David McWilliams had a great line around the time of the, the last recession that we were in about when the tide goes out, you get to see who's been swimming naked. And it turns out a lot of the rugby unions have been, and a lot of the leagues have been swimming away naked, putting their best face forward, but actually underneath, uh, not much substance there. So the Premiership is in trouble, the RFU are in trouble, the Australian Rugby Union is in trouble, uh, the Six Nations itself as a, as a block are probably in a bit of trouble. And we have one of the most important elections in sports administration history going on at the moment where Bill Beaumont is up against uh, Pichot. And it's hard to know what we should be rooting for as an outcome. Yeah, it is difficult. I think um, the current pandemic will probably um, awaken a lot of unions, um, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, as to um, their financial positions and the dangers that, uh, and probably the lack of potential investment and growth uh, financially that the uh, and, uh, and Nations League which was proposed last year, which was knocked back, could generate. 
I think there was a real fear when that proposal was put in place that um, it came from some of the Six Nations teams about relegation. You know, 12, 12 teams in a Nations League playing in similar windows. So the Six Nations would still continue. Summer tours would continue and November internationals. But the summer and November internationals would now be league games. And um, at the end of that year, there would be... Uh, the possibility of relegation. So I think there was a real fear from from Six Nations teams. Um, and we've had this debate before. It's kind of ongoing about Italy's participation in Six Nations. Should there be a relegation there? Should Georgia, Romania, Russia, somebody else come into the Six Nations and have an opportunity to play there? So it's, uh, it's driven by finances. And I think this will be a bit of a wake-up call for all the unions uh, about the possibility I think there's a real fear, and even more rugby have admitted this, there was a real fear about that proposal, about the control and where it would go. And um, if you get deep down into it, um, the security around that. But I think the appetite is certainly growing with the pandemic that's going on at the moment, that it's, a, it's the way to go. And it's really interesting that um, there's not a lot of difference in both manifestos of, of Gus Pichos and Bill Bowman's. Um, so it's hard to kind of look at each manifesto and their proposals and say, well, I'm going to vote for one or the other um, because they're, they're quite similar. Um, I think player welfare is a big part of it. Um, the global season, uh, the Nations League, all that kind of stuff. I think one, one kind of issue and, and mistake that's obviously has been addressed since is... Um, uh, Bill Bowman has, has kind of aligned himself with Bernard Laporte, who he wants to be his vice chairman. And Laporte came out a number of weeks ago talking about a, a World Club Championship, which would replace the European Cup. Um, and that certainly ruffled a few feathers and, and wasn't that popular the way he came out and said it. Um, he's quite powerful, Bernard Laporte. Um, you see what, he's, what he did to, to get France to 2023 World Cup uh, after South Africa were the recommended bid or the recommended uh, country to, to host the, the, the World Cup, he kind of stifled that plans, those plans and got France. So he's quite powerful, um, can influence a lot of people. And um, that kind of rocked Bill Bowman's bid a little bit. And also the fact that uh, they aligned themselves, Fiji were, are going to vote for Bill Bowman and they aligned themselves. There's obviously contra there's controversy there with... Um, filling one of the executive committee positions with with the controversial Fiji and Francis Keane, who has a bit of a checkered past um, of, of homophobia and accusations of, of um, manslaughter, a cover-up there and all that kind of stuff. He has since been removed from that nomination, so they've tried to clean up their act a little bit. But um, I think Bill Beaumont is probably a safer pair of hands um, Gus Pichot is certainly going to bring a huge amount of enthusiasm and 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 vision, I think, I suppose. But it's it's hard for each you. It's quite difficult, I think, to kind of decipher from both their bids who's going to do what different. Isn't, isn't that the problem here, that there's no shared, clear vision for what the future of rugby should look like? Because you see the, the premiership clubs in England wielding so much power with the union and the union really struggling financially, which is bizarre to me when you think about it. Just, I was on the way in going, the, the, of all of the unions in the world, for, for the English RFU to be struggling to break even, make profit, when you consider that they have like the biggest tradition, the biggest playing base, the most access to capital of anybody, they're based in London, where there is money sloshing around the place, and particularly for the demographic that the rugby people come from who are running that sport. It is ludicrous that, that, that they are so weak and that they have allowed the clubs to become so strong. Th th this is all leading to the question about centralised contracts and whether or not there should just be centralised contracts, which would elevate the international game, and then you'd have the club game, and then you'd have grassroots football, grassroots rugby feeding everything else. But there's no shared vision that there should be a sport that is controlled at the national level with centralised contracts. It just doesn't exist. There's, there's no agreement that that has to be the future of the sport. And that's the problem here. 
and th that is the problem, I think. And um, it's England and France are probably the two um, club um, nations that, with their clubs that kind of dictate that that status quo, if you like, that um, the clubs are, are in so much power and control. They're owned by private, uh, the vast majority are owned by private, uh, privately owned. And they dictate when their players are available and, and the RFU have to negotiate with them and and reimburse them for use of their, their international players. So um, it's the same in France. I think there has been a little bit more unison in France in the last couple of seasons around the release of the international players. But ultimately, Jared, this will be decided by the clubs and a wrestle for power, really, which is... I think Gus Pichot is arguing uh, a lot for change around that, particularly for, you know, the control that maybe England and France have over 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 the governing body and the decisions that are made. Um, a lot of these guys are on these executive committees are, are involved with clubs as well, and and maybe their clubs are more important to them than the international game. Um, and I think that's maybe Boyd was some resistance last year again to the Nations League because. You can understand if the Gallagher Premiership, they want to protect protect that, that tournament and um, they want to make sure that their clubs are, are sustainable and viable. And it's it's a very tricky situation. I don't have the answers because um, the players are, are being dragged in the middle of this new Nations League, obviously, um, because you know if there is more fixtures and if there is more international games, and that they become very meaningful games now, whereas before there would have been a bit of, you would have been able to manoeuvre a little bit because, and rest players, the clubs will see less of their players. Um, the July, the, the traditional June test window for summer tours is moved this year for the first time to July. That was with a view to giving the players some rest um, and, you know, with a view to player welfare. But, there's so many elements to this. It's um, I think the, the big point here, Ger, is like we said at the start, it's the financial uh, possibilities here with broadcasters, with sponsors, and CVC were behind this uh, proposed takeover and a massive push for this Nations League last year. Um, I think the unions will now see the reality really is I think that rugby needs to go to this space to try and make it more an, of an attractive global game and to maximise the financial possibilities there. And you can just imagine, and I've been on summer tours and played November internationals, and I never looked at them as friendlies. I always thought that they were, you know, competitive. But ultimately, um, there's no trophy, there's no points uh, at the end of those games. They're really test test matches. With a Nations League, obviously, if you have points on the board um, and points available, they become certainly not any more viable to the players because I think the players who play in these tests um, put a huge amount of pride into them and they're seen as ultra-competitive. But I think to people outside the game, they will see a tangible results or points available and, and league points and positions in leagues and stuff like that. So it doesn't really add more inter international games. It just makes these games certainly uh, puts more at stake in them. So I think that summer, whoever wins this, Bill Beaumont or Gus Pisha, I think, I think we're looking at the po real probability of a Nations League and and the realization that a lot of the unions can can maximize their their fina uh, uh, finances in, in in a lot more from from the possibilities around that. I think there's still going to be a real worry and a fear um, for tier two nations. I know both both men have um, put proposals in about uh, more support for tier two nations, more regular fixtures. Um, but that was part of the debate last year as well. You know, do you bring Japan? I think Japan and USA were going to be added to the the ten tier one nations, and that's the way it was going to start off. But how do you select those? You know, you, USA and, and Japan jumping into those twelve, and and where's that going to leave the other 
unions, the tier two nations, is there going to create more of a gap? Um, but it'll be interesting to see how, how it happens. The, the voting will finish on Thursday um, and we won't know the result for two weeks. But I think we're certainly going to see some change in, in the global game. What, what about the Club World Cup, Alan? It, 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 as if, if you were back in your playing days right now, is that something you would favour? I guess you, you mentioned Japan and the USA as well. They would both have teams involved in this. This is clearly an effort to try and reach the global game, the club game, into uh, a more global sphere. Yeah, I think from a player, like as a player, you'd love to have the opportunity to to play against club teams across the world and play against Australian, South African, New Zealand teams. In, in, in a competition. Um, I think the problem here, Owen, is where do you find the time? And and I think Bernard Laporte, when he came out a couple of weeks ago, and he said that he, Bill Bowman has since said he's been misinterpreted. Um, I hope he has, because I think my big issue there was you cannot get rid of the European Cup. I think the European Cup has been fantastic. I think it has some flaws, like all competitions. Uh, the Pro 14 has flaws. The Gallagher Premiership has flaws. Um, but European, the European game, I think, is incredible. I think it's it's um, it runs smoothly. I think um, the travel scenario, teams flying in and out of France, you can get over and back in in 48 hours and play your match and stuff like that. You know, if you're going playing Southern Hemisphere teams, you're going to be heading off for a number of weeks. Where are you going to find the time for that? I think they re. Um, he 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 came out uh, Laporte and 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 changed initially what he said and and ratified it in a different way that he was looking at maybe doing this every couple of years, like a World Cup for international teams that you do a World Championship for club teams, which finding a window for that is probably more feasible, and I think it'd be an incredible opportunity for clubs to. To qualify for something like that and 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 play in a, a club world tournament, but um, regards every year, I just think the logistics of that and and what the Pro 14 say, what did the Gallagher Premiership say, what did the Top 14 say? If two or three teams out of each competition has gone on a world club tour for six weeks, and you know they've got to continue on and play in their prospective leagues and stuff like that. So um, with all this talk that's going on about the the Nations League for internationals and maybe a World Club Championship possibilities, I think something will happen. And I think there is a realisation that for rugby to be more financially viable and stable, that ways need to be looked at generating more finances and make the more game the game more attractive and more globally connected, if you like. And maybe I like the idea of what Pisha is saying about, you know, international teams and maybe Lions tours going to different countries and, and you know, spreading the game. Because I think, um, you know, you look at football, it's 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 a global game. It's in every country. Everybody loves it. Everybody knows about it. Rugby is not the same. And I think the challenge is to try and make rugby more attractive um, right across the international world, if you like, which it is a challenge. Um, you know, you have your traditional... Uh, rugby playing nations and we've seen a lot of growth and, and you know what Japan did at the World Cup um, took the world by storm really USA is a, probably a sleeping giant with the athletes they have there and probably the resources maybe that they can create um, but I, I think there's going to, you we're definitely going to see some change but like I said both their manifestos talk a lot about change and, and the need for change so um it's a kind of a North versus South scenario where the Northern Hemisphere are back in Bill Bowman, the Southern Hemisphere are back in Gus Pichot. And we've got to wait two weeks to find out exactly what happens. It looks like Ireland, according to Roy O'Connor today, have uh, voted for Bill Beaumont. So it just, it, like, look, we're, we're out of time in this, but it does seem remarkable to me that all of a sudden Bill Beaumont's going to be an agent of change when he's been sitting there for the last couple of years and not that well, much Well, to be fair, changed. Ger, he was, he was uh, pro the Nations League. And I, I think there is a big realization that he's got to, you know, implement change. And you know, there is, there is this perception about rugby and and all the different unions that it's run by kind of older people with with very uh, set mindsets who want to keep that control. 
if he wants to get support and garner support, and I know he's tried to do that in the last few weeks, he's got to make sure that he lets people um, you know, have their voices and have their opinions. I think that's what Pisha has done. He's He's been really open about how he's he wants more equality right across the game. You look at the, 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 the Six Nations and the Tier 1 Nations, they've got three votes. Tier 2 Nations have got one vote. That is unfair, and it's something that probably needs to change. So um, it's like a politician getting the top job. Whoever gets this, they've got to back up what they... Yeah. What, what they say and what they, they, they say they're going to implement. But it's it's a minefield of decision makers out there who can object and, and not, you need people to to agree to decision and change, you know. So hopefully we will see some change in a All positive way. Good stuff, Alan. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. It's bang on nine o'clock and you're watching OTB AM. We're going to have Miguel Delaney along in about 40 minutes' time to talk about the latest in the uh, Saudi sport washing along with the... Uh, purchase of Newcastle United and what is going to happen with uh, regards to the Premier League. OTB Mount Rushmore moves to Galway in a few moments time but uh, I do want to talk about this because every Saturday on Off the Ball uh, uh, John Duggan and Dan and Johnny are revisiting a different World Cup. Here they are talking about the 2006 version. Have a look. And nine minutes into the game against the Czechs uh, he scores sent off against Australia as you say gives away the penalty against France equalises against France in the final with that header receives the Zidane headbutt which he deserved and then scores in the shootout that's, uh, that's some catalogue for a guy who was in his 30s at the time um, uh, did, like did, he deserve it, did, he deserve, did, he, did he deserve it I mean I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it here like, clearly like his comment to Zidane and it's, which we don't know very, we, we don't know what he said by the way no but he, he did a book I think around 10, 11 years later and he, look he's said Madarazzi has said several times that it was obviously related to as, you know, Zidane family member his sister yeah. that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the commonly accepted version of the story now I don't think that's really disputed um, at this stage I mean, it's obviously, you know, a horrible thing for anyone to hear, but I do sort of have the view that, I mean, if you are, like, sledging and stuff that's said on the pitch, you know, if you're Zidane, you know, across the course of your career, you know, with his background, he will have heard and been on the receiving end of some horrendous things. And, you know, that, unfortunately, to some degree, is part of the game. I hate to say it. Like, I mean, you don't condone it. You're not saying it should happen. But be realistic. You know, mad stuff is said by people when they cross the line. Zidane had the mental frailty that he wasn't able to deal with it. And you have to be able to deal with sledging. But if you're to talk about the three villains of football that come to mind, I would be thinking Van Bommel, Pepe, and definitely Matarazzi. Not Henri. No, not Henri for 2009. Yeah, but uh, that, that's bad. But like players that like were, were genuinely quite dirty in, in, in an era when football wasn't dirty. And Matarazzi, I, I always remember him as being um, a player that was kind of prone to the, the odd tuggishness. And uh, I, I, as much as Zidane shouldn't have reacted, I, I, I could never really forgive Matarazzi for that because uh, it, it, it ended up uh, with Zidane obviously having that ignominious end. So was it Zidane watch for the final in, like live in the, in the Olympic Stadium? I missed, I missed the headbutt. I absolutely okay. missed it. I actually hadn't had not got a clue what had happened. And then, of course, they show a replay, which I didn't see either. And then they stopped on the replay because the crowd went completely mental. Um, and it wasn't there wasn't fisticuffs, but there was certainly like a down to my right. There was a bunch of Italians who were up and going, "Ah, oh, look what he did! Look what he did!" And the French people were getting very, you know, because he's just been sent off, and he's absolutely the biggest icon that they've ever had. Um, so there was there was tension. But the other thing about the the World Cup final is that there's very few supporters from both teams. There, so the atmosphere, yeah. like I wouldn't have been terribly surprised if a Mexican wave had broken out. Uh, maybe, maybe one actually did break out. I'm just trying to think, but like in before the penalties, it's it's the type of atmosphere where you'd be like, oh, for God's sake, don't tell me everybody's going to stand up and do a wave now just before the penalties <laughs> happen in a World Cup final. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB. Sports Radio. Here at OTB, we're not just about sport. Our man Richie McCormick knows his tunes. Every day at midday, Richie will be bringing us his isolation mix. It's an hour of music to help you switch off from the workday, even if you're working from home. Stick on the mix, get some fresh air, and take a walk while remembering to keep your two-meter social distance, of course. That's Richie's Isolation Mix. Every day at midday on OTB Sports Radio. Listen on the Go Loud app or at offtheball.com forward slash radio. I'm not worried about it. I can stand over this. Cora Staunton, Lee McHale, Kevin Kilban, and Kieran MacDonald. OTB AM's Mount Rushmore. Yes, it is time for us to move the mountain 
And uh, if Muhammad can't make it to the mountain, the mountain can make it to Morris Ross and Yukali. Good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. How are you guys? How did you sleep? This is uh, so much pressure for various people. Nathan said he didn't sleep a wink before he had the responsibility. How did you get on last night? I swear to God, I have slept more before the leaving cert. Um, I just, it, the stress that it brought me, I have to say, I, in my own head, I came to a one, two and three very quickly after thinking it out reasonably. Four. Mm. I spent a long time thinking of that fourth one. And um, last night, didn't really sleep. Saturday night, stressed out. Not helped by the constant barrage from people on Twitter saying, you absolutely must have this person, that person, and WhatsApp messages from friends and colleagues and cousins and relatives and everyone who I've ever, ever met in Galway who had an opinion on Galway also giving me their opinion. All very valid, but um, it just all adds into the stress. Tune out the noise. <laughs> That's the only bit of advice that we have is tune out the noise and go go with your heart, Maura Trasse. The format of this is very straightforward. Maura Trasse is going to pick her four. We're going to give Michael Lesser, who's our special guest today, the opportunity to remove one of yours, but also to tell us who would be on, on his version of the mountain. But ultimately... The choice of three quarters of this, at least, is on you, Moratrasa. So uh, let's get your first couple before we, we hear from Michael Lister about who, who you'll be putting on his. So you said the, the early ones were straightforward and easy enough for you. Yeah, and um, I think, first of all, I think it's very important to say that we are very lucky in Galway that we have the best county ever in Ireland. And uh, we also have a great variety of athletes from male, female, athletics, you know, team sports, everything, national, international. So I had a bit, I have a big long list of like everyone who absolutely deserves to be on that Mount Rushmore one way, shape or form. Four pages, Jer. They, they're going to, you know the way the Oscars start the music when they're like get off the stage? <laughs> when you're on page three, we'll be like, start the music. Well, I'll, I'll, do you guys want the whole long list? Not really. I'd like to hear who your first two are. <laughs> well, okay, maybe, fine. Maybe give, fine. Us, give us some people you left off who you thought might have been um, in okay, close I'll enough. Tell you, I'll tell you who I left off. Um, and this is even worse, nearly. Um, I left Eamon DC off. I left um, Ender Colleran and Sean Purcell off. Right. Yeah. I left Olive Lucknan off. Right. Let's get into I who you left. put on then. Give us your first two. <laughs> uh, okay, my first two. Um, okay, Ivory Heon, Joe Connolly. And Ivory though, Joe Canning. The two Joes. The two Joes. Too many Joes. I mean, if you want to play a hurling in Ireland and to a high level, especially in Galway, just have the initials J and C, you'll be grand. Okay, so give us why you went for Joe Connolly. Joe Connolly, because he's so much more than a herder. Um, like, I wasn't even born when he made that famous speech in 1980, and I know it word for word. And people who don't speak Irish in Galway and all over the country know this, know that speech word for word. He was the icon, I think, for that era of the early 80s when there was no joy in the world, really. And people who just had that feeling of unbridled joy that you're able to stand up in Croke Park, release that feeling, that wave of positivity. And also, like, being from the west of Ireland was dismal. Like, you know when you watch films like The Commitments and stuff and they paint Dublin as a horrible place with no aspirations or anything to look forward to? Like, magnify that by a hundred if you're west of the Shannon. And even more so, again, if you're an Irish speaker west of the Shannon. And um, it just it surpassed more than hurling. It was showing that the west was awake, Galway was awake, we were worth talking about. And also because Galway were that team that promised so much and never, ever delivered. And finally... Finally, in 1980, they got over it. And he just, to this day, he can't walk down Shop Street without people wanting photos with him, including people who who weren't even alive, like I said, when this happened. People who might not know much at all about hurling, they all know Joe Connolly. And I think they were my, when I was putting together my kind of criteria, what you needed to have to qualify for this, was that you gave people a feeling of Galwayness, that you represented Galway, that we were proud of you, you were one of us. And it wasn't so much about the winning, just because you won a lot of things, does not mean that you're a wonderful athlete, if you know what I mean. It's being an athlete is so much more than that. It's personality, and he had it in spades. Okay, I, I can understand that. That there's like um, an iconic moment. The on the field stuff is important, and obviously he was great at that. But there's actually something much more beyond that. Yeah, that, that and he's still so active. Like he's involved in the Irish language. He's involved with the Galway Hospice. He's always talking. You'll always hear him on Galway Bay FM about various fundraisers and charities, and he's very vocal now. But you know for you know, the health of, and well-being, physical health and well-being of men of a certain age. You know, there's not many people doing that. And he's 
always been ta- he takes anything by the mantle and he goes off and he does it. And it's always, I feel, for the good of Castlegar, for the good of Hurling, for the good of Gaelgar, for the good of Galway. And I just think that should be celebrated. OK, so you've got Joe Connolly and Joe Canning. Talk to us about Joe Canning. Why is Joe Canning still active, of course, still has the opportunity to embellish his own uh, legacy? And I'm sure he will over the next uh, couple of years, hopefully. But why is he on your Mount Rushmore? Um, I thought about this and I decided I wasn't going to go down the Shane Hannon route of not giving somebody their place just because they're still playing. Um, I know, and I know perhaps Monaghan people might have felt Conor McManus should have been there, but at the same time, it was a very valid Monaghan Mount Rushmore. I don't think anybody could argue with it. However, I think Joe Canning is today's hurler. People who don't know hurling, be you from Galway or not, all over the country, and we all know it's very difficult to recognise hurlers now because I'll have to wear those helmets. You don't have to have any interest in GAA to know who he is. And also, he was he's just not even was. He is a magnificent hurler to the point where nearly it goes against him. Like if he doesn't score two twelve in a game, people are complaining Joe Canning did nothing. And let's not forget, and I don't want to sound like sour grapes here, but like in the All Ireland final in twenty 20- 18 when they were playing Limerick and um, Limerick won the final they won it fair and square but Joe Canning despite being coming back from injury and nearly being half crippled by the end of it nearly snuck Galway back into it that was a one man band for that second half it was all Joe Canning and he does it all the time he works hard on the ball off the ball and we saw last year as well when he wasn't there at the championship Galway fell apart they had no leadership on the field without Joe he is more he is more than a great hurler he is he's just when Joe Canning's playing, Galway people play, uh, read the sigh of relief. And he just comes across as a very nice person. He doesn't particularly court the limelight. He can't help the limelight when you're that wonderful. It's going to come upon you. And I remember as well, actually, in 2017, when they won the All-Ireland final, when people were going around celebrating, he kind of took time aside and he stood with Tony Keady's kids. And I just thought, there's a guy who understands Galway, you know, and he understands, it's again, it's more about hurling. It's about community. It's about social connections. It's about family. And... Uh, and thankfully and hopefully, he'll still be around for a few more years to come. Why, why do you think uh, Joe Canning has reached that level of being a hurling icon so quickly, Morchasse? Is it because he was so good at underage? Is it as simple as that, that he burst onto the scene so quickly? I think that's definitely part of it. I think it's also because he's involved with Port Tumna, which is obviously another very famous and high achieving hurling club, which also gave him, he comes from that long lineage of Cannings as well. So he had that kind of stuff already where people were going, oh, look at this new gentleman coming up through the ranks. We used to hear about him. I remember growing up in County Galway throughout my teens and early 20s, you'd hear about Joe Canning. And don't forget, I'm from football country. And even we knew who he was. Uh, to me, that's always a good sign. But I think he, because he has, you know when you hear about wristy hurling and he has the flair and he has the magic, like the flicks he's managed to do, uh, everyone will always remember at that point he scored against Tipperary in the dying seconds in the All-Ireland semi-final in 2017 on the turn after fluffing one just a few seconds beforehand, didn't matter, he's able to pull it out of his head. You're always guaranteed that Joe will create magic. And nearly, like I said, what goes against Joe is that he creates so much magic that sometimes I just think we don't appreciate it. And I just think sometimes legends can still be playing and you can still say, you know what, you are a legend. I think you've conferred for us this morning, certainly in your mind and in the minds of a lot of people, that Galway is uh, primarily now a hurling county, not a football county, because you've gone for two hurlers. Uh, you've gone for Joe Connolly uh, and Joe Canning. They're your first two, uh, Maura Trassa, and uh, I, I like, I like, you know, I, I agree with that. Um, let's bring Michael Lesser in at this point for his his judgment on your two hurlers. Um, Michael, I, I think. Good morning to you. First off, how are you? I am very well, and I'm sitting here listening with great interest to what Maura Trass is saying. The other thing about it is, she's gone for two hurlers, but at least there's a relief in this, because I was expecting her to go for four people from, from Carrow Row or something like that. So, you know, we're, we're in a close situation at the moment. We're heading in the right direction. So I, I think there's consensus on Joe Canning. Is that right? Is, is Joe Canning on your Mount Rushmore? 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 I, I am in the happy position uh, in contributing to this in the sense that I can sit in judgment. Now, Maura Trassa has to make the picks and she has to make her argument for her picks, obviously, as, she, as she's doing. Or I can just sit here nodding my head and making judgment calls about it. And I already have one or two judgment calls in my head at this stage, given what she's already said. But I will hold my cards close to my chest until I hear her other two and then we'll come in swinging. OK, OK, OK. This is, this is good. OK. Oh, dear. Um, right. <laughs> who else have you got for us, Maura Trassa? Who You must have a footballer, surely. There's one footballer in the history of Galway who deserves a place on Met Rushmore. Who is it? 
Absolutely. And he is coming in now in not so much third position, but number three in, in the Mount Rushmore. And that is, and again, this is very difficult. I would like to point out that I was getting in touch with Tommy Rooney over the weekend asking, for the love of God, Tommy, can I not just, you know, give a team, you know, give them a whole part of Mount Rushmore? And he was like, no, if I had my way, I would have done Galway 1980, Galway 98. But no, not allowed, apparently. So to try and find the one footballer who I think would epitomise everything that is great about Galway football throughout the years, and you've heard me mention those are legends, and I know you're thinking, play the music, MT. The number three is uh, Porrick Joyce. I should put my collar up for this, shouldn't I? Like why, why is Joyce the, the example from the team that won the two All-Irelands? Why is it him that stands above all the others on that team? That is a good question, um, because you could argue, why not Kevin Welsh, who actually took on the Galway job and not many people wanted it. He was also a Galway legend in his own way. Um, and I decided to go with back back to my original thing, which was feeling what somebody epitomises and a bit of panache and a bit of style. Porrick Joyce had style, like, and he still does. Like, it's not that long ago, I remember being in Pierce Stadium when... Uh, Nestor Mode were playing Killer Aaron actually and Porik was at the sunset of his career at this point and during the first half he kept Killer Aaron in the game because Lesser Mord couldn't handle him and Lesser Mord only ended up winning the game because they put three of their players on him for the whole second half and at this stage I presume you know a little bit of pace had been lost because he was in his early 40s at this point do you know what I mean but back in the day I remember 1998 I was a teenager I was 13 14 years old this Galway team burst out in front of us and we had the likes of Michael Donlin, Porrick Joyce, Jaff Allen, who is there. He's on my, always on my desk. We had all these, you know, Tomás Mannin, these young men with a bit of style about them, a bit of panache and a bit of personality. And I think maybe this is part of the reason why some of the more recent day hurlers and footballers, you know, when I, I sent out, you know, tweets, Instagrams, asking people who would you like and why, you know, I thought my own thoughts. And they're so media control now, we don't know who they are. Whereas from 1998, thanks to a year till Sunday, thanks to because they went around every parish in the county. We met these players. We grew to love them. We felt like they were one of our own. And he's he he was just a wonder. He still is a wonderful footballer. And the fact we could see that in Galway when he took the Galway senior team on board there a few months ago, there was this collective, oh yeah, PJ's come home. And he's more than football. He, again, when you think of Galway, you think of Porrick Joyce. So that was why I put him in as the Gaelic football representative, if that makes sense. And it was two to one hurling to football because you're only going to have one footballer, am I right? Perhaps could be a female footballer. Okay, sorry, but uh, from the from the Galway <laughs> football team that won in the nineties and noughties, yes. and from the great Galway team from before that period, there that's the he's the sole representative. Um, Michael, yes. is is the two to one ratio hurling to football fair in terms of what Galway's Mount Rushmore should have in your view? Again, Ger, I'm holding my cards. I am not going to throw them on the table just yet. Now, I, I am, I, I've got my own selection, so I might have to jump in at the end of this, right? But the one thing about Porrid Joyce is he's a, a club mate of my own, Killer I actually remember that match that Maura Thrasser was talking about against Lattermore uh, a little while back, where he actually just was taken out of retirement, if you like, more or less, to come back and keep Killer Wearden uh, uh, in the race, but but I I'm not sure is she going to go for another footballer here. She's kind of hedging her bets a little bit about it. I do know tomorrow, Trasset. There's four male participants here, and we don't have a female Galway person yet. So I'm waiting for your next shot. Who have you got first? <laughs> well, this okay. This is the one I struggled most with. Um, and actually, a serious point of this, there was a few uh, gentlemen who decided to get in touch with me over the Twitter machine over the weekend saying, oh, because of 2020, you have to have a female in there, not because she deserves it. And one in particular who was very derogatory about a female Galway hurler who has two All-Irelands under her belt and a host of All-Stars. Apparently, she wasn't good enough either. And this is not women's fault that we don't know who they are, because until TG Gahar began broadcasting uh, ladies football, until the last few years, Camogie began to... I suppose, knock off the shackles, so to speak, and be allowed to actually hurl. We didn't know who a lot of these women were. That's not their fault. That's not to say they're not wonderful representatives of Galway. And this is the one I really struggled with because I was thinking the people I want to select, I want them to be representative of young and old, male, female, city, county, Connemara person, North Galway, East Galway, South Galway, that people will go, 
I'm not sure I put them in that order, but fair enough, I can see why they're there. So I struggled back and forth. And I, I was, I think what eventually made the decision for me for this, uh, the fourth position was over the weekend, I was researching, going through back and forth, talking to people and watching TV. And again, it comes back to the feeling and the feeling this person brings up on you and the memories they conjure into you inside. And again, this is where I say, not women's fault that they haven't been given that platform to do so. They were well able to do it. We saw it there last September, great day in Co Park. And um, so, will I give you maybe my short list for fourth position, then tell you which one I came up came with? Absolutely, the end. go for it. Okay, Christy O'Connor Jr., Annette Clark, Trace Mar, and John Muldoon. Okay, so that's um... and yeah, all were very worthy. You couldn't. I don't think you could argue with either of them. Who'd you go for? And I struggled. And eventually, I think what put me over the edge was, you could say this is craftiness uh, on the behalf of the rugby community. TG Kaha re-showed the, the Pro 14 final against Leinster there a few years ago and the outpouring of emotion, and especially for John Muldoon after he finally, finally reached the pinnacle after, you know, working so hard for so many years. So, Ivra Kaha on Galway's Mount Rushmore, John Muldoon. So, just to recap... Joe Connolly, Joe Canning, Porrick Joyce, and John Muldoon makes it for you. So it's rugby, one football, and two hurling. Yes. And uh, Annette Carney and Tres Mar didn't make it. Tres Mar and Annette Clark did not make it, no. But I struggled with that. That's what made me toss and turn. Okay. And Chris O'Connor didn't make it? No. Okay. Again, that's, it was the fourth one that really made me work. work. Mentally, and I know there's going to be people around the country go, "No, what's she doing?" And there'll be people who will agree with me, and people who won't. And at the end of the day, it's just sport. It's the well, most important thing in the world, and the least important thing in the world. No, it's life and death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> Michael, you've you've got to sit in judgment. Now is the time to uh, come down from Mount Sinai <laughs> and deliver the tablets. What what is etched in stone for you? Moral Trassa, as the saying goes, sport is the most important thing of the least important things in life. So that's why we're enjoying this. Um, here's the thing about it. The four people that Moral Trassa has picked there are all worthy contenders. I'm not going to look at the list here and say I'm taking him out because he's not worthy enough. They all deserve to be there. But it's like picking any team. You have 15 places on the GEA team. It's like when I was Jar picking as a member of the All-Stars Committee and people would say to you afterwards, how in the name of God could you have left off so-and-so and this kind of approach? And I'd say, okay, you want to put him in. Who are you taking off the team? That's the bottom line. But guess what? I am Maura Trasse, going to take somebody off the team. I was a little bit disappointed that you ruled out, and he's not my selection, by the way, uh, Chick DC very early on in this conversation. Him and DC was a great soccer player in Galway, played for Aston Villa, uh, won a European Cup medal with them, um, or at least played in that particular team, uh, won what is now the Premier League with them. And I was just trying to think the other day, I have a funny feeling that I actually played against Chick DC back in the day, back in the 70s. Because when I was playing soccer in Galway, I know I played against Galway Rovers a couple of times. And I think Chick might have been playing. But anyway, he is not my selection. Sean Purcell is another one, more that you gave an early yellow card to. Sean Purcell, and again, I, I hesitate to, to pick a Sean Purcell over a Porrick Joyce or everything, because I remember Porrick when he was a young lad going to national school in Barnet Jarrod, and he is the legend that Maura said he was and all that kind of thing. But the thing about Sean Purcell is this, if you ask anybody in Galway, who represents Galway football for you? I think they would probably say, maybe those of an older generation, Sean Purcell would have to be in there. The team of the century in 1984, Maura Trasa. Sean Purcell was on that team, and not only was he on that team, he got more votes than the other 14 combined. What? So that, I think, what? is a measure of his status in Galway football. Uh, one in all Ireland, Port Joyce won two, uh, Sean Purcell won in 56. Uh, he won uh, a National League medal. He won Railway Cup medals as they were at the time. He captained Connacht to one of those. And of course, he won 10 county championships with Chum Stars during that period of time. So 
what a footballer Sean Purcell was. And I knew Sean personally as well uh, from my days in Tune. But they're not my selection. Another man that you mentioned there, and I'm going to put this guy in and take out one of your four. The person I'm taking out is John Mulholland. Not because I don't like John, not because he's not a great rugby player, but I feel in that selection, Christy O'Connor Jr. simply has to be in there. I mean, it's not all about Gaelic games and it's not all about rugby or the major sports. This man was a legend in golf, not only because of his, his achievement back in 1989 at the Ryder Cup and that famous shot against Fred Couples uh, that secured the Ryder Cup for Europe at that particular time. Christy was a winner outside of that, even in his later life, even when he left the tour and went on the seniors tour. He won a million dollars on the senior, seniors tour in the United States during that period of time and was just a fabulous guy. I mean, you said yourself, Moritz Ross, a few minutes ago, it's not just about your achievements on the sports field, but it's what you actually represent. You, you spoke about, and rightly so, about Joe Connolly. That speech that he made and all that he represented for Galway. Christy O'Connor Jr. represented all of those things in spades as well. So if I'm going to cast my, my card on this one, John comes out, Christy O'Connor Jr. goes in. That's fair enough, and you are totally entitled to do that. Can I ask you a little bit more about um, um, Sean Purcell? Because I mean, I'm interested in, in kind of different generations have different represent, representatives for their teams. And obviously for MT growing up and going to Croker for those big games, I can see how Porrick Joyce with his give me the ball, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry this team over the line no matter what needs to happen. What kind of a footballer was Sean Purcell? Like what, what was it that so inspired everybody to give him so many votes for the team in the, uh, of the century? Sean Purcell, and I suppose this again, Jar, is true of any team sport. We talked about Joe Canning, uh, Joe Connolly, etc. Let's be realistic here. No team is a one man band, and it's about the people that are around you. And he played, Sean, in a very good Galway team in the 50s. And of course, the other member of that team was the other two man, Frank Stockwell. And the two of them together on the field were known as the Terrible Twins. Sean Purcell was a centre half forward. He was big and he was tough and he was physical. And he did a lot of the donkey work uh, that allowed Frank Stockwell to nip in because he was a, a smaller, wiry forward. And Purcell did a lot of the heavy lifting to create the space for people like Frank Stockwell around him. Now, that's it. Again, I go back. This is in no way taken away from Pori Joyce, who was equally as good a footballer. But Purcell in that period of time was, was just the epitome of that Galway period. And, and from that success of 1956 with that Galway team when they beat Cork in the All-Ireland final, Parry Carrington's father, I think, was on that Cork team, as far as I remember. Um, but that then paved the way for the great Galway team of the 60s, which, which drew on that. You know the way a winning team creates inspiration for those that come after it? And, of course, the Galway team of the 60s won that famous three in a row. So Sean Purcell was at the fulcrum of all of that. And then Sean afterwards, uh, when he finished his playing days, was very, very much involved in Galway football uh, from a county board level and so on. And he, he was one of those guys that just was held in awe around Galway and in particular around the Tume area. And, uh, and I would have to say, for me, Sean, but, but I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't argue against, uh, against P. Joyce. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. It, I, it is completely a, a subjective thing, and that's why this uh, does engender such uh, strong emotion from people. There's one last pitch from uh, a Galway-connected person here, and Johnny Ward has also donned his Galway jersey to give us his last pitch for somebody to be included on Mount Rushmore. Have a look at this. Plenty of candidates for the Galway nod for sure. Uh, I would say in hurling, it'll be a toss up between Joe Cooney, Ollie Canning, and Joe Canning, and that'll be a tough one. Uh, soccer, probably Eamon DC was the main man. He was an absolutely iconic figure for Galway United and Aston Villa before that. Played for nothing. Eric Elwood, what a rugby player he was. Sean Amanian's uh, achievements in boxing, absolutely astonishing. Great backstory as well. Uh, but I'm going to select one from Gaelic football. You could go quite recent in the form of Michael Donner, the present manager of Porrick Joyce, who were real heroes of mine when I grew up. Uh, uh, before that, then you go back to the likes of Sean Purcell. But it's actually Matty McDonough who gets the nod for me. I'm a little bit biased here because Matty was from my local club and obviously a truly heroic figure. He won the All-Ireland at 19 years of age playing midfield in 1956. Galway hadn't won it 
before that since 38. And Matty was playing midfield at 19. I, I think that's a huge achievement. He was basically a mainstay for the Galway team thereafter. He's the only Connacht man to won four All-Ireland medals, won 10 Connacht medals for Galway, 64, 65, 66 were his other three, and scored the only Galway goal in those three finals, a fine left-footed strike. Galway wouldn't win the All-Ireland again until 1998. I think I was the last man to interview Matty before he passed away, and he was taken far too young, really, but a true legend, and his legacy lives on. Okay, so slightly left field from uh, from Johnny Ward there. Uh, Maura Trasse, there's a bunch of other names. Matty was on my list. Was he? Okay. <laughs> he there, was. <laughs> there were a bunch of other names that have been mentioned there. So uh, he's obviously one of them. Um, Eric Elwood, was he in contention for your rugby slot? He was. He was. Uh, but I just felt John Muldoon just more so. And there's no re- that Sometimes there's no reason. It's just a feeling. You took all of Loch Nan out of this in the first part of the conversation. Um, she must have been very close to it, though, right? She was. And literally, it came down to, again, like I know you guys were saying last week, you know, really helps to have a selection criteria. And also, she was born in Cork, which made it a bit easier. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Chassa, can I ask uh, one question? I'd be, I'd be keen to get uh, yeah. Michael and his face back on the line as well. Because uh, I'm not sure if Jerry's going to ask it or not, because this is basically his opinion. Uh, has Galway underachieved as a sporting county? Oh, oh. <laughs> well, it's not me. It's Jerry who made this point earlier on. I think no, he actually. I don't. Thing. I don't think. I don't think they have because you can argue, you know, should they have done more with the great footballers they had and the great hurlers they had? But the difference is, Galway, I think, has done what is exactly right when it comes to sport, which is opening up all sports to all people. So if you're from Kerry, for argument's sake, if you're not good at football, I'm raising an eyebrow because it's all you do. If you're not from Mayo, if you're from Mayo, you know what I mean? And you're not the top of your game when it comes to football, not doing the best you can do. I'm raising an eyebrow because it's all you do. Galway has, you know, last year, for example, you could easily, we could easily, if we had a championship this year, if it shows up or not, we could have Galway football, Galway hurling, Galway ladies, Galway camogie, all in the shake-up for a final. Plus a lot of other sports. I had a handballer in here. I had a lot of boxing involved as well. Um, athletics, Paul Hessian. We didn't mention him. He was also in the in the mix as well. So I wouldn't say they've underachieved. I would say what at most they could. You could say that perhaps the professional professional administration of things perhaps wasn't where it could be. But when it comes to athleticism and athletes and stuff like that, I think part of the reason why you could say Galway's finesse has been diluted by the diversity of sports, is how I put it. Hey, Michael Lister is back with us, I think. Um, Michael, that, that is a question. Like, So I'm looking at the role of honour for the hurling team and the football team. I think uh, I'm right in saying that the hurlers have won five All-Irelands and the footballers have won nine. Would that be, does that sound right? That's correct. I, I, I'm back with you. I get a suspicion that I was taken out of the game here after I dropped John Muldoon <laughs> off Laura Trotter's original selection because, interestingly, suddenly I was cut off in midstream. Uh, I'm, I'm suspecting Maura Trotter has friends in high places in the tech business. Um, <laughs> it's that rugby crowd. In terms, in terms of Galway and the question that you're asking Maura Trotter there about underachieving, no, not at all. Quite the opposite, in actual fact. One of the things about Galway as a county is you've produced famous footballers, famous hurlers, famous rugby players. Another guy that didn't get a mention here in any of this, Barry McGann from Bonnet Bay, yeah. a very, very well-known rugby player back in his day and played for Ireland, of course, very successfully and so on. So there's a whole list that you can go on and with. And Kieran Fitzgerald. And Kieran Fitzgerald, exactly. Kieran, where's your pride, everybody? Um, <laughs> And, of course, in horse racing as well, there have been uh, yeah. well-known trainers from Galway, etc. So you can actually keep going through the list. And it's because Galway is so diverse in terms of the popularity of daily games, of course, of soccer, of rugby. I mean, we mentioned Chick DC earlier on. He was a man who played for Aston Villa uh, at a time when Aston Villa were actually in Europe as one of the big teams in Europe at that particular time. So, no, no, I think Galway people can feel fairly proud of them, though. No, look. You mentioned you horse racing there, actually, Michael. I had Graham yeah. Lee on the list there as well, and I had Bobby Joe. He has a statue in Montbellu. <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly my point. Any time that I, I've driven down from Dublin, uh, down to the west of Ireland, down towards Barnard and down to Chum, I pass Bobby Joe in the middle of uh, of Montbellu there. Can I ask you a little bit though about the the hurling and because you know five hurling uh, All Ireland's nine football, and yet there's two hurlers and. 
one footballer. I, I think on, on both your lists, I think, Michael, if we were to, if we'd given you this task of picking four, it sounds like you would have had Sean Purcell on it. It does sound like you would have had Joe Canning on it. Um, w- would you have had Joe Connolly? I would have actually had your John Connolly. Ooh. And I can see why Joe was one of Maurice Ross's picks in that because of the, of the things we've mentioned already, that, that famous speech and all the rest of it. And, and as captain of that team, what that meant to Galway people, which, which was just extraordinary after such a length of time without winning an All-Ireland to suddenly come good and had been threatening to come good for a couple of years before that. Remember, when they won in 1980, they had lost the All-Ireland final the year before to Kilkenny. The reason that John would be there in my selection is John was there with Galway Hurling back in the 60s and he was soldiering on that team when there wasn't much to achieve for Galway when they were struggling before the Cyril Farrer era came in and started to put shape on Galway Hurling and through all that period of time. John Connolly was one of those guys who would have been known as a great hurler in a team that wasn't known as a great team. And he was fortunate, and a little bit like Joe Canning, in actual fact, from this point of view, John Connolly was fortunate in the sense that he was still around in his latter days in Hurling, when Galway won that 1980 All-Ireland. So he did get his All-Ireland medal. And for a while there, up to 2017, we thought Joe Canning was going to end his career without an All-Ireland medal. And because Joe, Joe also, for the last couple of years, has been struggling with injuries, and sometimes serious injuries, ligament uh, damage and so on. But, but the two of them actually did get over the line in their own respective uh, time. So for me, John Connolly would have to be uh, up there in the bracket. I think it's probably important to say as well, um, not to get too socio-economical and political about these kind of things, but when people say, should go away only one X amount of All-Ireland and X amount of football, I think people forget that while it is a large county and it has a city in it, it's it's kind of diverse. It's broke. It's kind of three people, three sets of different types of people. You've got Connemara, you've got the city, and you've got the rest. And a lot of those people had to emigrate over generations after generations after generations, which Joe Connolly actually mentioned in the speech there in 1980. And as a result, I think maybe if less people had to leave that county over the years, and especially the Irish-speaking areas, like there's no land there. There was no way to live back there. It's very, very hard to still, to this day, it's very, very hard to live in parts of County Galway. So I think when people say that Galway might have underachieved, as Michael said, I think, no, they've actually overachieved when you consider the variety of sports and how hard life was west of the Shannon. I think anyone on the Western Seaboard would probably agree with that as well. I think, Chair, just to pick up on what Maura Trasa is saying there, I totally agree with her on that point. Because for me, like down through the years, being from Galway, I, I find sometimes going west of Galway City, going out towards Connemara, out towards Morris part of the world out there, I feel like I'm in a different county sometimes. And I remember actually being over in West, over in Ballyconeely in 2017 when the week leading up to the All Ireland Hurling Final with Galway were in it. And it might as well have been Roscommon that were in the Hurling Final because people out that neck of the woods It'd be more football than anything else and really wouldn't know too much about the hurlers, I think. Would you agree, Morris Rasa? Yeah, I think that's definitely changing. It was definitely the way I remember yeah. like growing up. I have no memory, obviously, of the 80s whatsoever. I remember growing up in the 90s and stuff like that and Galway hurling getting to semi-finals and finals and watching it, but people not really getting excited until the football began to happen. But I think maybe due to maybe people having a bit more money, a bit more assimilation, which sounds like a silly word, but like for maybe from the late 90s onwards, Connemara people started going to college. We started meeting people from exotic places like Mount Bellew and Kilareran and Portunda. <laughs> and, you, and you began to get interested, in, like we were watching Fitzgibbon, Sigerson, and then you kind of, that rode you along with it. And with the rise of seeing more of it on TV and road access and actually everyone having their own cars for once, like it would have been unheard of. If you think about it, like if you're from Balnaslow and you're playing, say, junior football with Balnaslow or intermediate or senior football, and you're drawn in the draw against Clifton, it's, it could be a two and a half, three hour drive in the height of summer yeah. to get back to Clifton to play that game. You'd be in Dublin sooner. And I think people forget the vast size of that county and how difficult it is then to create connections. And I think, you know, better infrastructure, better media, better contact between people, more assimilation has only helped that. And I think, but still, I do maintain you will find more football people at hurling than hurling people at football. And probably because hurling is probably a better game to watch. 
Okay, so we're, we're, nearly, we're nearly getting to the point where we know who's going to be on Galway's Mount Rushmore. I think um, Joe Connolly, Joe Canning, Porrick Joyce, and Christy O'Connor Jr. Tell us, tell us a little bit more, because I have a vague recollection of um, the Galway Bay Hotel opening up, and he had designed the, the golf course there, and just kind of the sense of him being a, a proper international, I don't want to say a rock star, but there was an element of like uh, glamour to Christy O'Connor Jr. that there wasn't that much of in the 90s in Ireland, let's face it. Um, am I right about that, Michael? There's absolutely no question about that, and that was the part about Christy O'Connor. Apart from being a great golfer, he had that aura about him, and he had that charisma. Christy was a fellow who loved to sing a song, and he loved he loved social company. He loved enjoying your company as well. I remember on one occasion having a couple of pints with Christy in Dublin, and th- that evening he says to me as we're as we're drinking away, he says, "Come on," he says, "Come on." Drink up your pint. He says, we're heading to Cork. And I said, we're, we're doing what? He says, I, I have to look at a golf course down there and help him with the design of a golf course. He says, we're, I'm flying down in a few minutes' time. Come on, drink up. I said, Christy, hang on a second. Oh, I'm not going to Cork. I told Anne I'd be home for the dinner in about an hour's time. He says, not only you can, you can bring her from Cork, you can tell her you'll be home tomorrow. And he was that kind of character. He just loved the bit of mischief and... and would have got, and I know I would have had a great time with him had I actually been silly enough to get in the helicopter and go to Cork. I probably might as well have stayed there because I don't think I'd like to be ringing Nan Lester saying, sorry about this. Might be a bit late for the dinner. Might be there until tomorrow. You know. But Christy had that aura about him. He was, he was a great man for company and for making people feel at ease in his company, which is also important, I have to say, for sports people or for anybody. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Chris O'Connor Jr. is on your uh, Mount Rushmore more trasa. Uh, I, I, I couldn't argue against it. Like it's a bit like saying who's more worthy, him or John Muldoon. That's a ridiculous question with no answer. Um, but I mean, if, who am I to argue against the great Michael Lister, who some people would argue should be on Mount Rushmore himself? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, and I just, I'm just while I was listening to him there, and he was saying, you know, personality, this, that, and the other. And there's still so many people we didn't even mention, like. You could say that what he's just said about Christy O'Connor Jr., you could have said the exact same thing about Joe McDonough. No, and look, Joe had a huge role to play. Down through the years, there was a couple of times I think people would have liked to have seen me under a few rocks, whatever about up and one. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Moore, great stuff. One last question. Where is it? Where is Mount Rushmore and Galway? What's the location? Oh, the location is out, out in the Mom Valley. Fair enough. I'm putting it out there. You have to go past Peacock's Mount Cross, which actually, if um, people of a certain vintage and uh, location in County Galway be familiar, they'd know it. It's at a crossroad in between Clifton, the road up to Clumber, the road to Carrow, the road to Uchtarard, and they used to have discos there in the Starlight Ballroom the year I did my leaving cert. And uh, you'd go there and you'd meet exotic people from places from far away like Clumber and sometimes buses used to even come from Westport. The point is, if you put a Mount Rushmore in the Mon Valley, everyone from County Mayo all the way over to Port Tom, they can come for the drive and enjoy the beautiful, glorious views of the wild Atlantic Way and also soak in some legends. A good day out. Would you believe, believe Maura Trassa, I did DJ in Peacocks and Mom Cross many did years you? ago. <laughs> oh, wow. If the, if the walls of that place could talk, the stories we'd hear about both of you. Oh, Jesus, no. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Lister, Maura no, Trassa, no, no, no. thanks a million for joining us this morning, um, for putting their head above the parapet. It's Joe Connolly, Joe Canning, Porrick Joyce, and Christy O'Connor Jr., there is your Mount Rushmore Galway. OTBAM's Mount Rushmore. Miguel Delaney is going to join us next to talk football, but first, here's a snippet from the Sunday Paper Review at the weekend. Have a look. Kina, on page five, Tommy Conlon, is, 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 uh, he was prompted to write this because there was a Scannell documentary on the Bertie Bowl. And there was, I watched it. Oh, yeah, I didn't yeah. see this. And so, any, of us, yeah. any of us who covered the Bertie Bowler, this notion of, of, you know, there was this, this proposal to build this 80,000. Look, it's a it's a very complicated piece. He gets into the politics of it and he, he it's well worth a read if you don't, if you've often heard about the Bertie Bowler and not understood the implications of it and how it linked in with the FAI and also with the GA in opening uh, Crow Park for, you know, there was lots of stuff in it. It's fascinating, but it's the quality of the writing that is just so good in it. Like he 
noticed, which I did as well, in the in the interviews in in the piece, Bertie um, says, you know, he says, what did they call it? The Bertie Stadium or whatever, the Bertie Stadium. Nobody ever called it that. It was known universally as the Bertie Bowl. But here he was pretending he couldn't <laughs> remember it for some reason best known to himself. There are bits of this that made me howl out loud with laughter, even though he gets, you know, so much into it. And it's really, really pointed and brilliant. But there's one, I mean, for just for an example, to make people want to go to read it. He says, anyhow, no one suspected that the man in the cheap anorak was suffering from a bad dose of Oedipus complex <laughs> yeah. until he launched his fantasy upon an unsuspecting nation in the autumn of 1998. It's a brilliant piece. I wasn't fully aware of all the machinations. Like, I wasn't aware of how Aircon Park was meant, made to just go away with, the, you know, a million, 11 million quid given to domestic football and suddenly the FAI drops Aircon Park and he's got the minutes of that meeting on how... Uh, a few other political machinations went on. And then there is just the quality of writing as well. So, like, he says, he says at one stage, in reality, uh, Bertie was determined to build a stupendously expensive white elephant for his own honour and glory. But in his imagination, the man who loved the dubs and Man U and the few pints was thinking big. <laughs> it was everyone else who was thinking small. Yes, he was thinking very big. Bigger than the big fella and the long fella put together. Bigger even than the big Lebowski. It wasn't the health service or the education system that was going to be world class. It was his big swinging Mickey of a Coliseum. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, so, I mean, if it, if, it, if it wasn't so serious, it would be hilarious, but he manages somehow to combine both elements and it is really, it's a super piece. You should uh, get the rest of the pay-per-view on the OTB highlight section of your podcast on the OTB Podcast Network. Uh, now, Miguel Delaney, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Good morning. Uh, not too bad. Um, just it. Yeah, there's, there's actually been plenty of sports news and plenty of football news over the last while as football grapples with the crisis. I might talk to you about that in a moment, but the big story over the last week yeah. or so has been the progression and the seemingly relentless march to getting the deal done. So Mike Ashley, it looks like, is going to sell to a group which is essentially the uh, essentially Saudi Arabia. When it all comes down to it, it it's, yeah. it's not just a sovereign wealth fund. It is, the, it is Saudi Arabia as a nation state buying into a team in the Premier League. Yeah, which is an absolutely remarkable situation. And to be honest, I was surprised they went so direct. I mean, there's a similar project at Manchester City, obviously, that we all know about, Abu Dhabi. Um, and that is where Saudi Arabia also taken their lead, given that uh, Abu Dhabi and, and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, obviously, uh, are huge allies, having just conducted a war in Yemen. Uh, but even with Manchester City in 2008, and it was a more naive football world, there was um, more of a kind of degree of separation to it. it was, I mean... They, had a, they set up this uh, Abu Dhabi United group where Sheikh Mansour could buy the club as a, a quote-unquote private investor, even though everyone knows it's, got, it's a state operation. They've got some of uh, uh, Mohammed bin, or sorry, the uh, MBZ, the uh, crown prince of UAE or Abu Dhabi, some of his key people in the club, like Khaldun, like Simon Pierce. But with this, it was just so much more direct. So it's basically, as you say, the, so, the, so, the sovereign wealth, wealth fund and sharing that Mohammed bin Salman uh, the crown prince, or, or essentially the ruler of an absolute power of of Saudi Arabia. Uh, so it's much more nakedly a state project, which should raise so many more questions. But it's, it's incredible that the Premier, the Premier League doesn't really have any sort of protection, or even football in general in England doesn't have any protection, so states can't buy clubs. I mean, because that, that very concept is so absurd and so it, it poses so many troubling questions that it's actually remarkable to that happen and particularly when it's a state like Saudi Arabia I mean if you want to draw a direct link like we're talking about here I mean yeah the, the, the PIF are going to own 80% of Newcastle the PIF is chaired by uh, MBS and just last year or just recently sorry the US Senate passed a resolution holding MBS responsible for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and that's you know go before you get to all the various issues about uh, Saudi Arabia's human rights record and what they plan to do at Newcastle. Before we get to that, right, just explain why you think it is so ludicrous for a nation to buy a football club. Well, I mean, first of all, it really does come back to what clubs actually are, which is their community hubs, social institutions that represent their local area. That, that, that's what it comes down to beyond just the playing of sport. And it's from the initial playing of sport, that's what they developed out of. And they have a, they have a genuine social value. So they aren't just businesses. And the, the owners and directors test is there in the first place, or well, it used to be the fit and proper persons test. It's there to protect 
against kind of spivs and old-fashioned businessmen because, again, they aren't just businesses. There is an inherent social value to clubs. And it does feel like the rules haven't updated to reflect the situation. But to go beyond that, to take this thing that actually does have a community value, does mean something to people. And like I did a piece last year on the potential death of the 72, or, or a lot of the lower league clubs due to the um, due to kind of the, the nature of the modern game and all the rest of it. Uh, but like talking to people in government over here, you know, a, a lot of points made, and particularly in smaller towns or mid-sized towns, is that the football club is actually the only social hub left that lots of kind of the police lean on them, uh, lots of local authorities lean on them because it's the only place where people actually, you know, congregate anymore in that way, which, you know, is kind of opens up wider, wider values to all this. But then the idea of a state coming in to use that, to use what is one of the few community assets left. And, you, and, and, not, and the thing is, I mean, ultimately, in an ideal world, a football club would only exist for the purpose of the football club. Now, that, obviously, that was distorted with kind of all sorts of businesses coming in. And you can look to people like the Glazers, even FSG and Liverpool, who are ultimately in this for, for pure capitalistic purposes. But when it, when it goes beyond pure money making, because money making should at least feasibly coalesce with making the team better. So there is a certain amount of uh, a marriage of convenience. But with a state, I mean, this is about political ends. To, and... and uh, I mean, it would be a problem with any state, but ultimately most states don't see the need to sports watch, which is why in football right now, there's currently only two states or emirates that own clubs. That is Abu Dhabi, Manchester City, and Qatar with with Paris Saint-Germain. And now we could have Saudi Arabia thrown into that. And, uh, you know, look at the makeup there. This is essentially the the ongoing economic cold war in the Gulf, which has a huge impact on geopolitics, which is basically, which now has a power base and is directly influencing Premier League football, and like that, that's how did we get to this? It, it's like I think we saw last week when it looked like this deal could at least be slowed down because of the broadcasting complaint from B in Sports, who are a Qatari company, who made the complaint about you know Saudi Arabia, obviously as, as part of this economic cold war, have set up this pirate station B out Q, and like so suddenly Premier League football is just a proxy in this ongoing. Blockade, this 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 you know economic conflict between the countries, and it's quite sad when we got this. And now we're at this situation where it does feel we're just trammeling towards this takeover, which which let's not forget is a takeover of one of England's great clubs. Although it could be any club, you don't need to add a, 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 a adjective like great to take a, a great club by one of the three most criticised states in the world. I think you know we're kind of looking at some of the issues on human rights record, or Christians from Amnesty, and the only two countries that seem to get worse. Uh, at the moment, are Myanmar and North Korea, which says it all. And yet, this looks like it's going to happen. The B in sports thing slowed it down. Did it derail it in any way? Was there was there a way out? Was that some form of protection? Because I can't work out whether or not the Premier League are hands off and don't care, or if the Premier League are like, oh, actually, this is probably a step too far for us. Uh, that that kind of hasn't come out just yet. And so I, I wondered if the B in uh, sports... And the piracy was going to be a, a a blockade on this, which would allow everybody to kind of at least buy some time. Um, see, the issue with the Premier League, they're ultimately laissez-faire on this. And the Premier League, and, and this goes back to the breakaway, it's really just a members club. So any kind of change to regulation or any kind of strong move would really require the kind of, I mean, first of all, any, cha- any change to the, the charter regulations require a majority of the 14 to vote. And in a case like this, where you could say, I mean, really, there should be some sort of ethics clause where you can't allow countries like this uh, to, or, or owners like MBS to own a club. But that would that would require 14 clubs to vote and vote in favour of that, and most of them would just want to sell to the highest bidder anyway. So they wouldn't want that sort of protection in. Uh, as regards to copyright, uh, from what I, from talking to people last le- last week, what I heard was when like Amnesty and you know uh, Fair Square were writing letters, they didn't really care about that because they didn't think it would have any sort of effect. They, they, were, they were still confident the deal would go through. The broadcasting issue did cause a bit more wrinkle because it does put the Premier League in a difficult position because, I mean, the growth of this league is, is so inherently connected to its success as a, as a broadcaster, really. And even when, if you go back, when they were struggling to appoint a new chief executive, uh, the, the, the main parameter for the role wasn't any sort of traditional sports background. It was basically someone who had a media history because the, the main part of that job is negotiating broadcasting contracts internationally. Uh, so this does throw a potential issue, but I don't think from, from what I've heard, not enough because it's just not watertight enough, not direct enough. And like the, the mood in the Premier League is 
uh, unless there's an absolute watertight legal case to prevent this deal, that's not going to happen. That's connected to I think the laissez-faire nature of uh, Premier League negotiation, uh, Premier League uh, regulation. That way. And I mean, we, the, the new chief executive, Richard Masters, we had a press conference with him two months ago in which this was actually brought up. And we were, th- we were talking about the, the Newcastle situation, really. But he kept kind of putting the hypotheticals of the, of the owners and directors test. Uh, well, so actually, some of this morning just texted me. Uh, governments should really be stronger in this. Uh, there should be some sort of social protection for clubs or sports bodies in that way in general. But of course, obviously, with the, with the UK government, they, they have their own complications there since they have a strategic alliance uh, with Saudi Arabia. And as Fair Square put it in their letter to the Premier League on Friday, um, for, for the UK government, those, that strategic alliance basically will trump human rights concerns. Uh, but, can, but can you imagine, would the Premier League be, be more, w- 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 would they be as comfortable passing this deal through, or e- even the situation we're in where it looks like it's going to go through, if it meant at the same time that the Premier League CEO had to be up in front of uh, parliamentarians getting a grilling? About about the whole night, and, and and that's where this breaks down. There is it, ultimately, it is an insti- institutional problem that this is just allowed to pass through. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Miguel. Just one question I have on this is: if this takeover does go through, do we expect the Saudis to have the same sort of extreme change on our club that uh, we've seen at Manchester City, that we've seen at Paris Saint Germain? Is it almost a situation where they're later to the party and? I guess financial fair play has made a, a little ripple in the ocean here, but perhaps because of the years of delays that the, the Saudis have waited to make before actually getting involved with a Premier League club, that actually they may not have as extravagant a change in the fortunes of the football club as uh, City and PSG. Yeah, well, f- first of all, uh, financial fair play is definitely an issue there. It will slow them down because, I mean, if you look back to what City are now, so much of that was dependent on the first f- the four-year head start they had before it. FFP, where for two, from 2008 to 2012, they could pump so much money in. And, and, one, and one of the reasons City so quickly got so big was because, I mean, if, if you read that book, uh, The Club by Josh Robinson and John Clegg, they, their strategy was they just go to all their immediate rivals, which in that case was clubs like Aston Villa, Arsenal, and offer so much money for their best players. Uh, in one turn, strengthening City, strengthening City and kind of scuttling these clubs directly around them. And, and it worked and, and got them very quickly. Newcastle won't be able to do that due to FFP. But also... Um, I from what, everything I've heard, I do think there was a bit of a difference in outlook. Uh, like I, for the piece I did last week, I was talking to uh, Iyad al-, al Baghdadi, who has been he was targeted for assassination by the Saudi state. He was warned of that by the by the CIA. He had, had to be sequestered safety in in Norway, and he's only in Norway because he was uh, kicked out of uh, the UAE for the sense. And like he's kind of as much of a, an authority as you can get on these matters. And he did point out to me that. He, he said, beyond oil, the Saudis don't have as much of a culture of business professionalization as the UAE do. Uh, so he, and he did point to how the UAE, or so Abu Dhabi, very quickly went. And for City, basically, they went and appropriated the, the brains trust of football. They, they went and got the, the apple of football, went to Barcelona and put in Soriano, Big Eurosan, put in the best possible people they could. He doesn't, from everything you see in other businesses, and he, he said he didn't think this, the same would be the case at with it with Saudi Arabia, he pointed to an example of Turkey Al Sheikh, who was in in some way close to MBS. Like I can't remember the exact power structure, but he took over clubs in Egypt and it ended up being like a situation with him being abused. Um, at the moment, the talk is that Amanda Stavely will be running the club, who's the financier, who's obviously who was involved in putting the city deal to or in facilitating the, the city deal in 2008, as you say, and is now and she her company PCP will own 10 percent of the deal now. Uh, but also, someone else put to me said that. The Saudis actually have to be convinced of this a little bit. They're not going into, into it as kind of full-blooded as Abu Dhabi United Group were in 2008, and they're a bit more lukewarm. Uh, so I, maybe I wouldn't expect the rapid expanse or maybe the, the, the total level of project that, Ma- that Manchester City is. Um, so it, it might, but, but I, I, obviously they'll still look to spend a lot. Miguel, you're talking about, um, you know, would the Premier League be more reticent if they felt like they were going to be hauled in before one of those select committees? That we, you know, we saw obviously it did have an impact on uh, the public's perception on things like British cycling, for example. 
Um, and the answer is you, you definitely would be a bit more reluctant to get involved in something if you thought that you were going to be held to account for it. But the Premier League's answer to that will surely be the, the point you've made about how the British government are essentially partners with, uh, strategic partners with, with Saudi Arabia. Like, I, I can see how difficult a situation it is for the Premier League, for their architecture as well, to kind of say, well, like, my, my members here want to be able to sell to the highest bidder, which, you know, by ruling billionaires out and nation states out, will prevent them from making money down the state. And also the government. Like, am I, am I going to be the sports organisation that goes against the government and says, actually, what you're doing on a geopolitical level is wrong? So where, where is there a way out for, for anybody in this that is going to allow face to be saved or allow the, oh, we're actually doing the, the moral thing? Like, what, what's the path to this not being allowed to happen, at least in future? Well, I'm, I'm not sure there is one because, I mean, especially for the fact that this does feel such a line in the sand. For, for Saudi, a state like Saudi Arabia to own a football club just feels like the ultimate law uh, and really the point of no going back. And well, you could argue we're kind of been traveling in that direction for some time anyway. Um, and, and, and it's also why this is such a massive story beyond even the actual takeover itself because it does reflect where football is going. I mean, the game, and particularly the English game, through the break, well, through kind of initial regulations in the 1980s, through the breakaway of the Premier League, it's probably integrated hyper-capitalism more than any other industry on earth. I, mean, I did a piece on this in February, and like David Goldblatt, the football historian, put it to me basically that it's probably more hyper-capitalistic and more an open global market than international banking, which is saying something. And, and, and that's, I mean, and it, it, this situation then is a consequence of that and also a consequence of the Premier League kind of being so, you know, international non-judgmental about, about owners in that sense. Um, and, and, and yeah, this, this does feel it's ultimate consequence. And it doesn't, feel there, it doesn't feel like there is a way back. I mean, even connected to the government thing, obviously... At a government level, there's, they just don't want to get involved because of their strategic alliance with Saudi Arabia, even though they could actually probably sidestep that uh, and point to it's, uh, it's, about, it's about social protection for clubs, even though in this case it, w- it would feel so transparently about Saudi Arabia. But then you do get into problems about, OK, it prevents other clubs in the future and Ma- Manchester City are, are owned at, at, at the moment at 77% by Abu Dhabi. Uh, so, I mean, you, you could get into these arguments about the Glazers or Abu Dhabi having to give chunks of, chunks of their clubs. Um, so that's one part. Now, in saying that, it was put to me last week by both a sports lawyer, Kevin Carpenter, and by Nick McGee in Fair Square, that the regulations of the Premier League at, at the moment, they do actually, they would allow for potential is deal, but it would require very strict interpretation of regulation. That's the, that's the problem, I suppose. They're, they're so open to interpretation, so vague, when there isn't that will there. Um, and, 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 and at the moment, there's not like government pressure there. But even on a lower level of that, in this case, like I heard a story at the weekend that some concerned groups went to, uh, I better be careful what I say here because it was, it was off the record, like I can't give too much away. Um, they went to basically a concerned, or, well, a usually concerned politician uh, who, was, who had, been, had been very outspoken about Mike Ashley about to, to speak out about, against this. And they totally washed their hands of it, basically pointed out, oh, there's lots of bad owners. And I suppose the thinking there was they didn't want to go against this deal when they know that there's most of Newcastle basically wants to happen. And there is also the promise of investment in the local area, which again, and, and this is, again, it points to the other various strands of this, of this uh, story, where one reason beyond Mike Ashley, beyond the football, where, where people argue for this, this takeover is because ultimately the, uh, People feel that Newcastle is one of those cities that's been neglected by London, neglected by Westminster, and this will be the investment that's badly needed. But uh, but at what price? Yeah, it's the white knight that comes in, and you're like, oh, what what are the strings that are attached to the white knight? Like, oh, didn't actually look at the fine print. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the because I'm pretty sure it was your story originally about the uh, Premier League clubs um, cocooning their players in hotels and, and somehow trying to get back to play. It looks like we're getting close to some agreement, at least on the strategy in the background, about how many people would be involved in a match day broadcast, how many people would actually be in, in the stadium for playing behind closed doors. What's your take on, on the direction this is going at the moment? Like, h- How close are we to some programme for return to football sooner rather than later when it comes to Premier League matches and the completion of the season? I'm uh, quietly optimistic. Maybe that's the wrong word in the circumstances, but I think it will happen by 
uh, early to mid June. Uh, there was a will there, both from football and from government. Uh, government wavered on that for the past few weeks because of how the situation has gone. And when when it did, when the when the death toll in England did get really bad in the past few weeks, they kind of basically they stopped looking at football as an issue at that point. But that has changed a bit in the last two weeks. Government have gone back to their original thinking, which was that people need some sort of something, something to bring a bit of, restore a bit of normality and what better that than the, than the national game in England. But also that they feel uh, football could be one of those components that helps get the economy moving again. But because, I mean, the, if this happens, and I do think it will, there'll be TV mega events with huge advertising. I mean, even, I mean, and there are, of course, bigger debates about this. But if you look at, say, gambling, which is so, so key to... Um, media revenue I mean gambling advertising will shoot up and it, it, it will just it will cause a little bit of a circle that helps get things back to get the economy moving even and so there is a will there and that's why in the past two weeks as well the discussions among the actual Premier League teams have ramped up at the same time and now kind of from what I've heard even players have been told a little bit more about kind of concrete plans about what, what will be happening where they'll have to go uh, it should be kind of six weeks sequestered in a hotel um, I mean, very strange, but even even from the players' perspective, the will is there to get back playing. They're kind of bored of sitting around. But it, it actually makes sense. It's uh, money for the TV companies. It's money for the players. It kind of guarantees their wages in a way that they wouldn't be guaranteed if this lasted any, any much longer. And it's going to finish the season. That's Everybody's committed to finishing the season. Is that correct? Yeah, basically. And, like, and everyone sees voiding the season or even doing what they did in the Netherlands. But actually, the Netherlands did void it uh, as an absolute last resort. Uh, and that's not just... I mean, the easy accusation in these situations is always it's down to greed and money, and that's part of it. Uh, but there, there is a genuine issue about the kind of survival of clubs. I mean, for a long time, people have been saying that if there's any sort of delay, we could have up to four Premier League clubs going into administration. That it, it, like, it is that high. I mean, everyone looks at the, the Liverpools and the Spurs because of the issues like going to furlough. But it's only a certain amount of clubs that are insulated because football is ultimately, it's like the airlines, it's a cash flow business. And as soon as that flow stops, a lot of them are actually in trouble, particularly given how high the uh, wage to turnover ratio is. Um, so, so, but, but it's not just about uh, greed or money or survival. It's also the issue of sporting integrity in that there is a real quandary within the game about if it's cancelled, what do they do when they start up again? Is it just basically the 29-20 season restarted? How do you sort issues like sporting integrity, which is one other reason why they just want to get it finished? And again, to restore some sort of normality with football. That all makes sense. Miguel, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Miguel Delaney uh, giving us some thoughts on what's going on with the uh, Premier League. That's pretty much all we've got time for this morning. We've gone a bit over. It's five minutes past ten on Monday, the 27th of April. Uh, OTB is back in your radios tonight from seven o'clock. Um, the football show, much more with Joe and Nathan. OTB am back tomorrow morning. Kieran Donnelly and Jarlath Regan are going to join Owen and Ronan to discuss the next two episodes of The Last Dance, all of that and much more. You can subscribe to the OTB AM podcast. It's fully timestamped, which means you can scroll through whatever you want. And you can also watch back on YouTube as well. Alan Quinlan was on talking about World Rugby's decision-making. We had the Galway Mount Rushmore with Maura Trassa and Michael Lister, OTB AM, Ireland's first and only sports breakfast show live every morning from 7.30 until 10. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Best of luck. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. 